Thank you so much for attending this event. We're really happy to have you here. And we'd love to welcome you as new UCLA students to the Division of Physical Sciences and, um, and which, which departments that you're interested in. Most of the people here on the panel are from the Department of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences and our Department of Atmospheres and Oceans Research, AOS, Atmospheres and Ocean Science. According to the US News and World Report, UCLA is once again the number one ranked public university in the United States. We receive more applications than any institution in this country and the admission is very competitive. So the fact that you are here tells us that you are an extremely accomplished cohort and that you have tremendous potential. Our jobs are to help you realize that potential, help you to succeed at UCLA, and we're committed to providing each of you with the support and resources that you would love to thrive here while you're at UCLA and in your future. So I'd love to introduce you quickly to myself and the panelists, and then we can talk a little bit about some of our experience and hear some of your questions. So my name is Abby Kavner, and um, I've been a professor in the Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences since 2002. And I teach mineralogy, which is the first, one of the first um, classes in the major, if you're one of the geosciences major, and that's what I'll be teaching this fall starting next week. I study the behavior of materials at extreme conditions um, at high pressures and temperatures, and I'm a laboratory scientist. And I love having undergraduate researchers work in my laboratory, and I've always had students work in my lab. Um, in addition to myself, we have a, um, a cohort of panelists, and I'd love to hear um, people introduce themselves. Alex? Oh, <clears throat> hi, everybody. Thanks, Abby. Um, <clears throat> so um, so I, my name is uh, Alex Hall. I'm a professor in the Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences Department, and um, I study um, generally the topic of climate change. I'm especially interested in um, reducing uncertainty surrounding our, the future of our climate system. And I do a lot of work also with um, people who are impacted by climate change. And I run a center for climate science um, here at UCLA. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here and to meet some students and to welcome you um, virtually anyway to, to our amazing campus. Great. Kenzie? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Professor Mackenzie Day, and I'm the newest professor in the Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences Department. My research focuses mostly on dunes, dunes on Earth and other planets, and I teach sedimentology and field mapping, and uh, I'm very lucky to be able to take students into the field. So this past winter, we all went to the Grand Canyon and had some great hands-on learning there. So it's a, it's a good place to be. And welcome to UCLA. Josh. Always a challenge to find the unmute. My uh, I graduated from Atmospheric Sciences Department. I don't think it was AOS back then in 1994 with an undergraduate. And I went on to study further. I've spent most of my career doing uh, numerical weather prediction and what's called data simulation, where we combine observations and models to make predictions. And um, uh, i uh, spent time in laboratory setting, so federally funded research and development centers on university faculties and most lately co-founding and running a science team in a, in a startup uh, dealing with physical hazards associated with climate change. So pleasure to be here and I look forward to chatting with you all. Great, thank you. And Joe. Hi, my name is Joe Nahama. I graduated from UCLA in 1987. I received a geology degree from ESS and I went on to get a master's in petroleum engineering and I currently work in the oil business in California. Right. Great, thank you so much everybody. Um, I'd like to give our panelists an opportunity to share some advice or some of their personal experiences that might um, help you succeed in your journey here as a UCLA student. So before the event today, we shared three prompts with the panelists and we asked them to come prepared to talk a little bit about them. So the first prompt, and I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll pass it around the panelists. Um, 
the first prompt is, tell us about a personal value that you hold dear and that helped you to get to where you are today. Joe, can I start with you? Absolutely. Thanks. So my uh, some of the uh, values that I have, I think, uh, and l had to learn at UCLA was, was grit because the course load was so uh, demanding. So you had, to, you had to be persistent and work hard. Um, and you have to listen to people and listen to everybody's uh, perspectives and different views. And I, and I, you know, that's a big value. And one value I, I actually have that I got um, that I think is from the play Hamilton. And I don't know if you guys have seen the play Hamilton, but there's a song in the play called in the room where it happens. And one of the things I try to do and I encourage everybody to do is be in the room where it happens when you, it, where you have an opportunity to, to be with people and learn things from people and you need to be at the table with people and learn. And that's one of the values that I have, or those are some of the values. Great. Thanks. Kenzie. This is a great question. And I agree with Joe that, that hard work and persistence is, is really important, but something that I've tried to pursue at all the stages of my career is, is keeping it, fun and, and making sure that you enjoy what you're doing. And so part of the reason I ended up in geology is because I really, really love what I do. And, and I was able to to kind of follow that path and, and continue pursuing academically. And it was still difficult and, and UCLA is going to be difficult, but making sure that you're enjoying what you're doing and that it's putting you on a good path in the long term. Alex? Oh, this is a tough question. Um, well, they're all tough. The ones that you gave you're us. You're allowed but, um, to take a pass if you want. <laughs> no, um, you know, I think, um, you know, I've really wrestled a lot with um, the questions about, you know, whether whether you can separate um, ethics from science. Um, and um, and, you know, I think I think it's become clear um, with the increasing impacts of climate change that you um, that that's really tough to do, that you have to think about um, how the science you're doing affects society and you have to. Um, take societal considerations into account um, in terms of the science that you do and um, and also the the degree to which you engage with the outside world. Um, and I've concluded that's really necessary that that really has to be part of our science and um, and so that that's been a journey that I've been on. I started out um, my career thinking that science had to remain very pure and divorced from society, but I think that that just can't be the case that um, so I suspect Josh may resonate with that too, <laughs> um, given given his his uh, his background. But that's just a, a little exploration on that topic. That's great, Josh. You're right, Alex. It's it does resonate with me since we're here as a company to to try to bring the best science into impacts and and help the broader economy and in, in dealing with it. I'll just I think that. Um, one of the, the challenges today for me is is the scientific integrity from it, but it's from the other angle perhaps, which is ensuring that we're, we're remaining um, at a high level of integrity in our science. And I, I just, I think that thinking back when this question came, that goes back to the very beginning, which one of the things that I hold, uh, that I think about and um, have focused on through my life is um, making sure that, you know, I don't believe that I'm better than anybody else. Uh, we're all here. To be to be doing what we need to do, and everybody has drivers and reasons, and and being able to listen to each other is an is an important piece of the puzzle. And you know, when you get to UCLA and things get even busier than you thought it could be in high school, um, you know, remembering that everybody's struggling and and being okay with making mistakes is is a lot of the puzzle, and it sort of builds a foundation, I think, for for examining integrity. So, thanks. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh the next question that I have for the panelists is tell, tell us about a time when you accomplished something, even though you initially doubted your ability to succeed. And I'll start, uh, I'll start with Josh. With the noisiest background, um, just cut me off. If, uh, it's okay. It's real life. Yeah. I think, um, I, I think I had to think through this cause I've made a lot of, uh, changes in my career. Um, from lab to academic to now private sector. And, and I think actually 
one of the toughest things for me was going back was how was learning how to be an academic. Um, there was, you know, like, like everybody on this call, you sort of, you're at the top of your game intellectually for, for almost no matter what you do, but bringing that to being an, ac an academic and constantly being judged by your peers and having to defend yourself. And, you know, when I was a PhD student, getting, getting papers rejected, right. And these kinds of things and having to overcome these, these kinds of peer evaluations, I think um, there were moments of doubt, um, but, you know, through the hard work and, and believing in yourself, you know, you get through it. Great. Thank you. Alex. Yeah. I was thinking about this question. Um, I, I, you know, um, when I first came to UCLA, I was um, very, very um, nervous whenever I taught a class and, um, you know, I, I did tons of preparation beforehand and, um, and I think it probably really came through in my teaching that I was very nervous. Um, and, you know, I've just been thinking um, lately about my public speaking because I do quite a bit of teaching and public speaking um, outside of UCLA and um, I don't really get nervous anymore. <laughs> And even even if I'm in front of an audience of a few hundred people, um, and um, I think that just happened to me over time. And I think it, it just made me realize that a lot of the most profound changes that we go through are the ones where we really chip away at our um, at our deficiencies and our weaknesses. And over the course of years, you know, you really do change and become a new person. And I think that's really true, especially in the sciences, where you know, it really the best kind of progress is the progress that happens over a very long period of time. And I think if you just have faith that you eventually will overcome something, you know, and you keep on working at it, eventually you do. And that's, um, and that's, I think, the most, one of the most important life lessons that I've taken from being a scientist. Thank you. Kenzie? I think research is a really good example of this. You know, every research project that we do, fundamentally, you start out with a hypothesis and you test it. And, and most of the time, you kind of have a sense of where you're going and what to expect. But um, recently, I've been working on a project with a student where we found this, this thing out in the desert that we thought was an ancient dune. And so we've been studying it, and it's now very clear that it's not dunes. And so that, you know, at, at one point, initially, I kind of I thought that was a failure that, you know, I, I had... I'd gotten it wrong, but really we've figured out that this thing that looks like dunes is actually much more interesting. And so there's a whole other story there that's more important than just figuring out that this is a dune. So every research project has its own potential pitfalls, but it's that discovery that makes it very exciting and fun to continue working on. And Joe? Yeah, um, I would say uh, my growth was coming from a small town in California, Bakersfield to UCLA. And when I moved into Sproul Hall, everybody on the floor from the Bay Area to, in Los Angeles, you know, they had all these classes and things that I didn't have. And I really, really was worried about that. So um, it was the, the, the drive to study harder and, and do better. And all of a sudden I started doing well on my, on my tests, chemistry, geology, physics, and as, and I gained confidence. Yeah, you know, I didn't, I, it's not perfect. I, I remember I got a 19% on my physics midterm, don't tell anybody, but it, it was hard work. And then, and then that led to the fact that, Hey, you know what, if I can go through something as rigorous as UCLA, I can go and become an engineer. So I went and applied, um, it became an engineer at a uh, Colorado School of Mines. And then I leapfrogged from that throughout my career. The things that, that scare me or are or, or uncomfortable, you learn about them. You're going to have failures. For instance, I had to do work learning finance. I didn't know anything about finance. But you work at it. You learn it. And you're, you're not going to be perfect, but then you start getting it. And then, and not only that negotiation, I, I don't know anything about negotiation. We, we didn't have to do, but something, again, you study it, you learn it, you practice it, and then you overcome it. And that, and that's kind of how it's been throughout my career. And it kind of started from UCLA because man, I was nervous when I first got to UCLA. Thank you. Thanks for sharing those experiences. Okay. I have a third prompt which is tell us about a time when you initially felt like you didn't fit in 
and then eventually found your place. And I realized, Joe, that you told that story um, as part of the other prompt also. Um, so, um, which, who would like to, who would like to take that one first? I could oh. take this one. I, sorry, I, I think uh, <laughs> Joe's story nat naturally leads to this. I mean, to me, yeah. college, the biggest, the biggest thing that I learned in college was how to learn, right? And I think that's in line with, with what you're saying. And my, my, when this, when I got this question, I caught it, thought of something sim similar, right? So I, I um, started at UCLA as, as electrical engineering major. And by the time I was done with the year three, I just was not curious or interested in it at all any longer. And so that's how I ended up in atmospheric sciences. I switched over because I knew it was something that would simulate me intellectually. Um, so I didn't take, you know, my meteorology one class until I was a junior. And uh, it was a lot of catch up, but it was really, really rewarding. Even though the, the, one of the other classes I took my first quarter there was um, basically a self-directed graduate level study about air pollution and meteorology. And I didn't have any meteorology yet. And so, it was uh, extremely challenging and I felt very lost, but it, but pushing through that and actually trying to learn something out of that while spinning up in the atmospheric science department was a, was a huge growth opportunity. Great, thank you. I can tackle that <laughs> quickly. Um, thank so you, Alex. Um, I, when I came to UCLA, you know, I started doing research on, on climate change and um, which is a topic that touches on so many different aspects of the environment and um, it took me quite a while to find um, the community of researchers working on environmental issues and at UCLA because they're scattered across um, not only the South Campus, you know, the physical sciences and biological sciences, um, but there are many people on the North Campus as well, um, you know, working in the, in the policy realm. And so I kind of had to stitch together a, a community of people. And that um, that was the result of just hanging around for a while at UCLA, but also um, really being very proactive about, about reaching out to people. And I think with a campus as big as UCLA, um, you can be confident that you'll find your community, but you have to, you can't just let it happen. You have to sort of work at it a little bit. And I think that um, you know one thing that I think that everyone coming into UCLA should do is is really um, in the first month try to figure out where you know, which communities you want to get involved in and, and seek those, those communities out so that you're, <clears throat> that you find your place, you know, quickly. Yeah, yes. I, I love your emphasis on, commu you know, communal, communal values and the individual values. I mean, it's the panels, you know, the, the, the panels kind of discussing both of those ends. And I'd love to reiterate, um, you know, I'd love to reiterate Alex's invitation for everybody to find find communities, you know, so join groups of people that have some common interest and they will evolve with with time. Mm -hmm. Yep. Joe, Kenzie. I totally agree with Alex. I think, you know, UCLA has 40,000 undergraduate students and there's it's easy to get lost, but there are so many small communities and taking advantage of those opportunities, you know, whether it's a hobby, you know, find the other people who love knitting or the other people who love underwater basket weaving or you know, they're, they're there. There are so many groups of people on campus. And when we're here in person, we have the Bruin Walk and people will set up booths and there's all sorts of opportunities to talk to each other. And, you know, particularly now when we're, we're far apart, it's extra important to take advantage of those connections. Great. Joe, do you have anything to that? Yes, you I add? do. I want to add on to my my Great. Sproul Hall experience because when I got to UCLA, my optometrist the week before I started school gave me glasses that tinted whenever there was sunlight. So I get to, to my dorm floor, I felt like I didn't belong, and I'm walking around the dorm floor with tinted glasses, and no one could see my eyes. I was really embarrassed, but like Alex and Josh and Mackenzie said. It was all of a sudden I started doing activities with my dorm floor, number one. And and you just break the ice. As long as you're doing activities, all of a sudden with my dorm, I felt community and it started to build these friendships. And then with with the um, geology department at the time, 
I didn't know anybody there. I also felt a little lost. And I, I took a couple classes. I was in the geology department because my father's a geologist. And then I took a class, the uh, geology of California with Clem Nelson. And we drove all over, one, you know, for a week or more, all over California. And I bonded with these people, the community that Alex is talking with, bonded with these people. I had these amazing experiences and that, and then, and so I, ha I all of a sudden had two communities in this huge campus that uh, I was part of. And so when everybody used to say, oh, you go to UCLA, it's so big. I said, no, it's not so big. You have your friends there and there's just a lot of people walking around them, but they're there. That's great. Yeah. You know, I'd like to reflect on just kind of the some of the themes that I've seen come out of this panel discussion, because I think that um, there's kind of two two spectra that I that will be interesting and valuable to everybody, all of us going forward. Um, and the first one is the sense of individual values and expertise versus communal values and communal expertise. And we've all spoken to the, you know, to the individual hard work, the putting the nose to the grindstone, the craft of becoming a scientist and how it develops over time, that keeping your spark of interest and enthusiasm and curiosity alive and taking care of yourself so that you can do all of that. But on the other hand, there's also the importance of connecting with a group of people, connecting with your roommates, your classmates. One of the things we'll all tell you is to use your faculty, use your instructors, use your TAs, get to know us, come to office hours, send us emails. I mean, especially this fall when we have to make that, all of us have to make that extra effort to stay connected and we all crave that connection too. So that balance between what's an individual and what's communal. UCLA, our Bruin values are very much communal values and the campus comes together in unbelievable ways with its group of people. It's what I've seen through the years and I've become a much more communal science scientist with time. So the other contrast that I'd like to share that I pull from this conversation is this idea as a scientist of our job to be reason-based, to be quantitative, to make decisions that are based on evidence. And so all of the tools that are necessary for doing that are tools that are built over years, crafted over years, perfected, learned. You'll learn in your quantitative classes, you'll learn in your programming and your math and your geoscience classes. But also there's an aspect of our work or our life as scientists as citizens that is on this completely different axis of compassion or empathy and caring. So not only for each other as people, not only in a classroom as for you and your fellow students or for the instructors, for the students and each other, but also extending to our compassion and empathy for, uh, for our earth. And, um, and for the climate, for planets, when you're a planetary scientist. So those, those interplays are, I think they only get richer and richer with, with time. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for attending this event. We are so happy to have you here and eager to welcome you as new students in the Division of Physical Sciences and departments of atmospheric and oceanic sciences, earth and space sciences, and Institute of Environment and Sustainability. And um, I have here my panel. We might get one more person here. Yes, we can all wave. It's slightly, I'll tell you, it's slightly disconcerting for us because we can't see you, but we know you're out there, I guess. <laughs> we hope you're out there. Um, so as you may have heard, according to US News and World Report, we are yet again, I think for the fourth year in a row, we've been ranked number one public university in the US. Yeah. <laughs> Just one of many of our very high rankings. And um, as you also know, we get more applications, I think, than any other university. And you guys 
made it into the class that was accepted, which means that you are all exceptional students and we are super excited to have you. Of course, we are sad that we won't be on campus and we won't see you, but, um, but this won't last forever and we will see you soon. So we firmly believe that every one of you can succeed and that you can, what's more, succeed in um, in STEM, hopefully in the departments you came in, in or one of the similar departments if you decide your interests are slightly different. So um, in addition to myself, I have two alumni and one other faculty, and maybe one other faculty will join us. Um, Hop in is a yet another new platform for us. <laughs> we get new online platforms almost by the day these days. So maybe the other faculty is having a little bit of trouble. Um, but uh, so first I would like to introduce our panel. So I'm going to start by introducing myself. I am Suzanne Paulson. I am um, professor and chair of atmospheric and oceanic sciences. And I study air pollution and the interface between air pollution and climate change. And um, then I would like to have ask Ashwin to introduce himself. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Ashwin Visavada. I work at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And I was a um, earth and planetary science uh, major back in the day, uh, back in the last century. Um, and now I work on the Mars rover Curiosity uh, for the past, I think, 16 years. Thank you. And Abby? Sure, it's Perfect. great to see Ashwin because we overlapped our first years in the Department of Earth, Planetary and Space Science. Um, I've been there since 2002. I'm a full professor and I study mineralogy. I study the behavior of Earth and planetary materials. Um, I teach mineralogy in the fall and um, and do laboratory based research. Thank you. And Matt. Hey, welcome new students. My name is Matt Pinopio. I am a or I was a AOS major uh, graduated UCLA 2014. I am currently a program manager on the energy and sustainable operations team and sustainability team at Amazon where I work on renewable energy and other carbon reduction strategies across our business. Very cool. And then just joining us um, from the Institute of, from IOES, NEPSS? I'm not entirely sure. It's Mackenzie Day. Please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, folks. My name is Mackenzie Day. I'm the newest professor in the Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences Department. Uh, my research focuses on aeolian or wind-blown processes on Earth and other planets, primarily Mars. Welcome to UCLA. All right. Thank you, everyone. So um, we were asked to tell you about some of our experiences getting to where we are. And so we have some prompts, kind of like, you know, college essay prompts. And the first one is, tell us about a personal value that you hold dear that helped you get to where you are today. And um, can I start again with Ashwin? Sure. Yeah, one of the values that, um, I've always uh, thought was important and had kind of led me to where I am today is uh, teamwork. Um, to me, uh, I've always enjoyed being part of a group of people that's collectively doing something really great <laughs> or challenging and, and exciting. And uh, and what you know the, how that kind of blends in with what I do as a career and and how I got there by going to UCLA was the idea of being involved in. Uh, uh, in missions, spacecraft missions that go to other planets. And I always loved seeing how it took a whole group of engineers and scientists working together to pull these things off and make these great discoveries. So, you know, rather than being kind of a lone wolf uh, scientist, I always wanted to be part of a bigger group. And now I get to do that every day uh, with uh, several hundred people actually running the Curiosity rover. So that's my value. Thank you. 
Thank you. Very cool. Um, Abby? It's fun to think about the values, right? Because there's so many and they're all interwoven in terms of my life. But let me call out one of my values has always been curiosity. Um, that is, I'm curious about how the world works. I try to train myself to ask um, questions about everything. And as part of my research, I get to um, investigate and satisfy curiosity and learn new things and also teach students about um, definitely um, new facts in science, new processes of science, how we know what we know, um, but also how to ask questions and stay curious. So I like to keep that child, that kindergarten, that curious, that curious kindergartner in me alive. Very nice. Thank you. Um, Matt. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I think I would outline the value of persistence. I think it's helped me get to where I am today. Um, you know, a lot of you have just, you know, finished high school and I'm sure you were all very excellent in what you did. Um, one of the things that I look back to is my experience in theater. I used to do, th I did theater all four years of high school and it really rounded me out as a student, as you know, really excelling in science and math, but also being persistent in my creative side and, and really committing to that to that uh, passion of mine. And in my work experience, um, you know, I work in climate, I work in climate, I work in sustainability and the challenges that we face in this realm require a lot of persistence because it's, it's a big challenge that is going to require a lot of effort across uh, the globe to make sure that we are, you know, mitigating the worst impacts of climate change. So, it takes a really strong heart and a lot of persistent effort to um, to, to get to uh, to achieve the goals that I want to achieve. Thank you, um, Mackenzie. I think you're on mute. Yeah, it's a common problem. Uh, this is a great question, and I think Matt's right that persistence and hard work is uh, really important and a big component of of making it to your goals. But for me, one other thing that's been really important is enjoying what I do and making sure that the thing that I'm working really hard towards and I'm passionate about is is something fun, something that I enjoy. And you know, especially with everything that's going on right now, you know, I take solace in the fact that at the end of the day, I look at pictures of space and I do science on Mars. And that's so cool. So making sure that you're following a path that you are passionate about and care about is important. Thank you. So, so I'm going to answer that myself as well. So I, it's hard to pick just one. Certainly curiosity is a, is a huge part of what got me here today and persistence. There are times when it's hard and, um, frustrating and there are ups and downs. So persistence is a huge part of, of getting me to where I am today. But, um, underneath it all is a desire to, um, which, which over the arc of my life has really brought me great value, uh, a desire and a, the, the feeling that I'm serving society and serving the planet. Um, I think I kind of became an environmentalist when I was like 10 or something. <laughs> and, and it's been super important to me and super gratifying to be able to contribute in my own um, in my own way to finding solutions to the really uh, large and in some cases existential um, challenges that face us today. So um, I, I will say that that other people my age are sometimes a little envious that that they didn't that I picked this career path and, and they didn't. It's, it's something that gives satisfaction over one's life, I think. Um, okay, so the next one, tell us about a time when you accomplished something even though you initially doubted that you could succeed. So what do you think guys, shall I go in the same order or shall I change it up a little bit? How about Abby? Sure. Um, 
yeah, there's so many, there's so many aspects because I had no idea. You know, I had no idea where the path would lead me. Um, I will tell you some of the things that I'm working on now. So, um, I'm an experimentalist, and one of my one of the things I was always curious about was how instrumentation worked. I was trained as an engineer. And um, as part of my experiments, I get to learn how to run all of these amazing experiments. Um, it never occurred to me that I could actually design some of the big equipment that's shared by lots and lots of people um, until I worked with the equipment and then gradually said, huh, I think I could make this measurement in a better way. And then thinking about it and working on it, actually over the course of years, I said, huh, I could change this design in a way that other people can use it and we could make better measurements in this case of the behavior of crystals. Um, and so um, it took a lot of, it took a combination of learning how the measurements are, learning how the measurements could be better um, thinking about new ways to make the measurement. And then the final component was because I was working at a shared facility, was convincing all of the people around me that this is a better way to do the measurement. And so it involved lots of descriptions and showing people how to change something and do something different. So um, anyway, so that's a, you know, a whole set of of a, of a transformation um, that now is has resulted in, um, actually it's a beam lion at a national synchrotron facility up in Berkeley, having a completely different setup for people. Okay, thank you. Um, so just to my, my panelists, we're, we don't have that much more time. So it was a great answer, but maybe a little bit quicker again. Um, Ashwin. Uh, let's see. So I, I, I look directly back at my time at UCLA as a time when I probably one of the biggest times in my life where I had to keep overcoming challenges and and kind of keep reminding myself that I was able to succeed because it didn't always feel that way. <laughs> and um, and I think, uh, you know, I came to UCLA knowing that I loved the idea of working on these spacecraft missions, but I didn't have like a, a, a super, you know, high school counselor telling me exactly how to get there or anything. So I, you know, fortunate got into UCLA, but then I, I really sort of had to figure out um, how to get to where I wanted to go. And I had multiple majors and I had a lot of um, ups and downs with uh, finding my, you know, how to pursue the passion uh, that I eventually found uh, almost in my senior year. Um, but it all came together and, um, and, you know, and, uh, I'm, I'm glad for that, of course. Thank you. Okay, Matt. I can I can wait for if we're running out of time. I can defer. Um. Okay, as you wish. So, um, Mackenzie. Um, I'll jump in just because mine's a little different. I teach field geology, so I get the. I'm very privileged and then I get to take students out to the field and show them rocks in nature. And we go to, uh, we went to Death Valley last year and I got to take students to the Grand Canyon. And uh, there was one time when I had a, a student who was consistently lagging behind and I wasn't quite sure why. And I, you know, I was concerned that I was failing this person. And then after talking to them, it was just the case that they were so interested that they kept getting distracted every, every time we would move on to a next stop. And so it wasn't that they were lagging, it's that they were having having too much fun, which was a great feeling as a teacher. Okay, I'm gonna tell you one just really quickly. So um, I got my PhD from Caltech, that little technical school across LA. And, uh, and I didn't think I'd get in. And the only reason I applied, I, uh, I applied because they, it was free. They didn't have an admissions or an application fee. And I didn't think I'd get in, but I did, so. Um, okay, so then the next one is tell us about a time when you initially felt like you'd not fit in and then you eventually found your place. And so let's start with Matt. This is a better, uh, I have a better answer for this question, so it's perfect. Um, so I'll keep it quick, uh, kind of similar to Ashwin here. I mean, I actually started out at UCLA as a civil environmental engineering major. 
um, stuck with it for about a year and a half, kind of dabbled around in biz econ and math. And I was like, what do I really, what am I really passionate about? And I knew I wanted to work in environmental sciences. Um, don't know why I didn't see AOS when I was looking through the majors, uh, when I applied to UCLA, but, um, you know, I definitely felt lost those first two years. I was doing very average in my classes. Mm -hmm. I saw that my uh, peers were doing much better than I was, and I just didn't really feel that felt like I belonged. And once I had joined the AOS program, found the atmospheric science major and was with, you know, great professors, like the ones in the room here, um, you know, I really like fell in love with what I was learning and knew that I wanted to carry my knowledge from here into my career in the future. Very nice. Um, okay, Ashwin. Uh, yeah, you know, um, man, I, I resonate with what Matt shared just now so much. Uh, I had a very similar experience and I'll just um, not repeat everything he said and, and get it's sort of my, my end point was feeling like I belonged uh, as a scientist, because I, you know, I can definitely say when I look at my life, there was a time I was not a scientist, and that was a time I was a scientist. And UCLA was that transition, and and a lot of it was sort of, um, you know, becoming a scientist and then becoming part of that peer group, recognizing that you, there is this group of people who share the same passions you do, think very similarly, analytically like you do, follow the same curiosities that you do, and it was wonderful to find that group and and become part of it. Very nice. Um, Abby? My turn to defer this question. Aw. Um, Mackenzie? My comments echo the other ones. You find your people, and there's a lot of people at UCLA, so just find your community. And it might take a little while, but it's, it's here somewhere. Um, so... Fitting in is something that lots of people have sometimes when they're when they're not feeling like they fit in. Certainly, um, certainly, you know, even majority male, whatever, straight white males have that feeling, and then everybody else has that feeling often even more. Um, I've certainly certainly experienced it at many times. I think I was a little oblivious to all the messages about how women shouldn't do science when I was young. I'm pretty old, actually, so this was a while ago. There was more of it then. Um, <laughs> and um, but, but then I encountered it later, for sure, and definitely felt like I didn't fit in. Like, when I applied to Caltech, I thought I wouldn't get in just because, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't have a huge ego. Um, but but everybody, there's a place for everyone, and um, and it works out eventually. And uh, these departments in this in this area are are really super friendly. Not perfect, for sure, but super friendly and super accessible. And um, where we really will welcome you with open arms. If you want to do research, if you want to talk about stuff after class, we're going to be there. Welcome all. Thank you so much for attending this event. We are all very happy to have you here. And we are pleased to welcome you as new UCLA students to the Division of Physical Chemistry of physical sciences, sorry, and the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. So you can see I've got chemistry on my mind, right? And I've been asked to uh, let you know, in case you didn't weren't aware, that according to US News and World Report, UCLA is again the number one ranked public university in the USA. And we receive more applications than any other institution in the country. And as you know, admission is very competitive. So the fact that you are here tells us you are very accomplished and have tremendous future potential. So we firmly believe that every one of you can succeed at UCLA and we're committed to providing you with the support and the resources necessary for your success. So my name's Kathy Clark. 
Um, I'm a professor in chemistry and biochemistry and also associate dean of physical sciences. And I'm a biochemist. And the classes I've taught recently are Chem 147, which is careers in chemistry and biochemistry, and Chem 164, which is free radicals in biology and medicine. And I thought I'd just also add that I'm a double alum of UCLA. Uh, BS Biochemistry 79, and a PhD in Biological Chemistry in 85. And I joined this, as, this department as an assistant professor in 91. So you can see I've been at UCLA for 45 years. <laughs> Pretty scary, right? So my lab studies energy metabolism and oxidative stress, and we're particularly interested in a lipid called coenzyme Q. That's essential for respiratory electron transport, which is why we breathe, and in defending our cells against the damage from life and oxygen. So in addition to myself, there are other faculty and alumni here today to welcome you and answer your questions. And I'll now ask those on our panel to briefly introduce themselves. So I'll start with Larry and Nancy Davis. So please introduce yourselves. Well, hi, everyone, and congratulations on getting into UCLA. It's really an accomplishment. Um, my name is Nancy Davis. I graduated with a BS in biochemistry in 1976. Um, met my husband, Larry, there in physical chemistry in upper division class. Um, well, actually, it was physics, and then we were in physical chemistry together. So um, that's kind of me. <laughs> uh, what are you doing now? <laughs> oh, and actually, I did go on to my master's degree afterwards and into in the industry. I was a supervising chemist. And then after a few years of that, I ended up in a family business and I own my own insurance agency. Cool. Larry? Hello, I'm Larry Davis. Uh, I also have a bachelor's in biochemistry in 1977. Uh, so I, I married an older woman. Uh, uh, I have... I don't know if you know this, Catherine, uh, but I also have a master's in biological chemistry from the School of Medicine in 1979. Wow. And uh, I was only in chemistry for a little bit, and then I went off to law school, and uh, I've been a practicing attorney for the last 35 years. Uh, okay, that's a little bit of who I am. That's, that's great. Thanks. And uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Ann Hong Hermstorff. Hey, my name is Anne Hong Hermesdorf. I'm uh, in the same department as Kathy, chemistry and biochemistry. I'm also in the biochemistry part of the department, and I teach um, an introductory lab course where we do produce biofuels and bacteria um, over the course of that whole quarter. And on this project, we teach many really popular methods in biochemistry labs that you can use for many different other projects. I um, came to UCLA in 2009 as a postdoc from Germany. And then I started the position to teach the lab course in 2014 in the fall. So this is now my 19th quarter coming in, my 19th wow. quarter. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to having you in my class, hopefully. Terrific. And I finally, our, our, our other panelists, last but not least, is Anna Fisher. Hi, and congratulations to all of you for being accepted to UCLA. Um, I applied to only one school, which I don't recommend today, <laughs> environment, but I was very lucky to be accepted at UCLA, the first person in my family um, to get a college degree. I graduated from UCLA with a bachelor's in, orga in organic chemistry in 1971. Uh, applied to medical school, but was on the waiting list the first time I applied and uh, got was on the uh, MD-PhD program. So I did a year in chemistry, um, and um, which was a really great year. I was a TA in organic chemistry and then started medical school, graduated uh, from medical school in 1976, did my internship at Harvard General. So I was at UCLA or UCLA affiliated institution for over 10 years. Um, was very fortunate to find out that NASA was selecting um, people for the space shuttle program in 1977 and was very fortunate to be selected. And I flew on the space shuttle Discovery in 
1984 on a really exciting mission and I've talked about that a lot at UCLA many times and so and I was with UCLA for I mean at uh, with NASA uh, for 36 years and nine months and retired in April of 2017 so I've been very fortunate and oh uh, debt of gratitude to UCLA for the amazing education I received. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to give our panelists now the opportunity to share their advice and experiences that might help you succeed in your journey here at UCLA. And prior to today's event, we shared three prompts with our panelists and asked them to share with you their reflection. So the prompts, I'll just quickly go through them. So the first one is tell us about a personal value you hold dear and that helped you get to where you are today. And the second prompt is tell us about a time when you accomplished something even though you initially doubted your ability to succeed. And the third one is tell us about a time when you initially felt like you did not fit in and then eventually found your place. So. I'll now call on the panelists, and you can decide which prompt you want to tackle. And um, let me start with Larry Davis. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks, Catherine. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna choose the third prompt about belonging and the the, the intimidation, if you will, of coming to UCLA. Uh, I graduated from a high school where there were 900 students in my graduating class, and a lot of people come from a, a much smaller class. And coming to UCLA, you might have 60 or 70,000 people on campus pre-COVID and hopefully after the vaccine. Uh, and it can be a very intimidating place. However, if, and now UCLA has a lot of groups to join, a lot of, a lot of activities someone can engage in away from class. And I participated as not in the chemistry department, but rather I like to go to football and basketball meetings. And so I joined, if you will, a group of hardcore fans who sat out and waited for football and basketball games. And that became my group. And even though you're the new person on the block when you get there, as long as you show up, you will slowly get into whatever the group you, you, you'll slowly have conversations and you'll be able to communicate and you'll, you'll feel a level of relaxation and you'll become a part, you'll become assimilated into that group. And then everything will be cool because you will have, you, you will have gotten into the, the spirit of UCLA and you won't be just looking at the, at the lines on a sidewalk. So the best advice I could give you coming into this, this environment of UCLA is join something, belong to something, get going into something and just keep showing up. There are so many things to get involved with other than just going to class. And trust me, it will pay off in the long run because those people that you meet in those groups will become your lifelong friends, no matter what your career. So I could actually add to that question if you want. <laughs> On a different, yeah, Nancy. Note, a different note, I was yeah. incredibly shy when I came to UCLA. I had just turned 17 three weeks before the fall started. So I didn't have any confidence. I didn't have friends coming in from high school with me. I was by myself. I had to kind of navigate. So I was a little shy, a little timid. And it wasn't until my junior year that I finally said, okay, I'm going to go to office hours. I went, I don't know if you, if any of you knew Dr. Jordan, he was a biochemistry professor. I was nervous and it was the best thing I ever did was go see him. I saw him regularly for advice. He encouraged me. He was so nice. So he even encouraged me to go on to get my master's degree. That's when I had a sense of belonging and the confidence at UCLA. And I wish I had done that a lot sooner. Um, that would be my, and the TAs, they want to help. The professors and the TAs, they want you to come to their office hours. They want you to help. And that would be my advice. Our son went to UCLA biochemistry major, and he did the same thing. He went to office hours all the time. So that's my that's great. advice. Great advice. <laughs> so, Anne, let's hear 
what you thought about in response to these prompts. Yeah, I guess I would pick the third prompt when you say about how I could grow and transform with what I'm doing in this delay. And so when I first started teaching this class, I had 280 students in a quarter and I hadn't really taught lecture before. And I thought, oh, how I'm going to pull this off? I'm not that extroverted, I'm kind of more introverted. And so it was a little bit difficult to imagine to talk to so many students. Um, but I've overcome that fear and I've, I've been told that I'm actually even sometimes kind of funny in lecture. And um, so over the course of the 18 quarters that I taught, I'm more confident every time. And so one can get over these kind of initial fears um, by just always doing them over and over and over again. And uh, to the, what Nancy just said, I also really, really urge everyone just go to office hours. Don't be shy, don't be afraid of the professors. We want to help and we can be doing that much easier if you actually come and tell you what you struggle with. Tell us what you struggle with, sorry. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And so Anna, I'd love to hear your response to this, to any one of these prompts. Well, I'm going to kind of take the second one about, you know, overcoming things because, um, as I mentioned, I was the first person in my family to go to college and I really had no idea what to expect. I, uh, both my daughters went to a private high school and I watched how they're prepared and they had exam weeks and all the sorts of things. So when I came to UCLA, I was totally unprepared. And yet, even though it's such a big university within, in my dorm, I was at Reber Hall, we formed friendships and slowly that environment began to be comfortable. But, the, the, but it was a real challenge with all these young other students who were as smart or uh, that you were competing with. And, um, and it was a real challenge. I really had to work hard. And, but the confidence I gained as I moved on through the classes at UCLA Chemistry gave me the confidence um, to know that I could start to feel confident about anything. Um, as Nan said, I was incredibly shy. If I had known that speaking mm -hmm. in the public or doing things like this was um, something I was going to do in the future, particularly be an astronaut, I don't think I would have applied. But at UCLA, when I was in the master's um, program there, we had to give a seminar and that taught me that um, even though you're terribly afraid, you can overcome that. And so each step along the way, um, I always tell people that each step, when I was an undergraduate and graduate, and then medical school, I mean, that was another huge thing, you know, uh, even with all you've learned, there's so much to learn and, and so much to remember. And then all the things I achieved at UCLA made me very confident when I became an astronaut, that even though I didn't know what I was doing or how to be one, that I would be able to succeed because I'd had so much preparation uh, at UCLA and as, um, Larry and Anne have said, uh, and Nancy, you know, going to talk to your professors is really important. I, I felt the same intimidation that, that you all talked about. And, and then I found out they really cared. And the chemistry department, I'll have to put a plug in for the chemistry department, even back in the 1970s was a very warm, inviting um, uh, department to be a part of encouraging women at a time when women weren't encouraged to do those things and still is today. So I think you're so fortunate to be uh, entering UCLA, um, take advantage of everything that's available there. And I, wish you all well. I, think, I think this is great advice. Uh, I, it seems like the themes here are seek out your professors, go to office hours, Talk to your TAs, ask them what research they're doing. Um, uh, you know, make connections, maybe uh, join a, f uh, like the, there's a chemical uh, fraternity, Alpha Chi Sigma. I don't know if, I actually wasn't in it, but <laughs> I know a lot of my students have joined that and, and it's a really good way to become connected. So I'll just open it up to all of you. Do any of you have any other, uh, advice for 
uh, the folks listening. We have about two minutes. You know, some, some advice that I think my son would give because he graduated in 2012 was if you do establish that good relationship with your professor and he had um, quantum physics or quantum mechanics, whatever, mechanics. He, really, he just forgot. that professor actually loved him in the class gave him a letter of recommendation and he put it on file at the career center. So a couple of years later, when he was applying for jobs, it was already in hand and that professor remembered him from that time. And that if you're doing really well in the class, that's one piece of advice I would give. Well, that, yeah. what goes with that is that the professor could go on sabbatical. And if you need a letter of recommendation and the professor can't be reached, you're, you're stuck. So get it while the professor knows you and likes you and get it done in, in real time and then put it on file. It can always be used. Yeah, great that's idea. great advice. Yeah. Oh, and so we, Anna or Anne, do either of you have anything else? Well, I would say use the library. Anna's muted. Oh, Anna's is muted. she muted? Okay. Good, and I muted myself. Um, Thank you. But the, thing, uh, the thing I would say is to be persistent, you know, don't give up, um, work hard, you know, do your best, but don't give up. I was not accepted to medical school the first time I applied. It turned out that the year I spent in graduate school in chemistry was something that was very valuable and helped me get selected as an astronaut because they were looking for people with backgrounds in two areas. So I had a background then in inorganic chemistry and in medicine. And so what at the time was a huge disappointment um, turned out to be um, career-wise beneficial and also really beneficial to me, the experience of being a TA and uh, and um, and then eventually getting my master's. So it was, uh, uh, I just, the, it's so easy when things don't go the way you want to get to the you give up. And I would just encourage you to not ever give up, be per persistent if there's something that you really want. And there's usually a way to figure out how to accomplish what you would like. If you, yeah. if you don't get yeah. up. Yeah. Well, thank you, panelists. I think this is really great advice. You all have such inspiring life trajectories. Hey, welcome, everybody. Um, we are so happy to have you here. I'd like to welcome you as new UCLA students to the Division of Physical Sciences and to the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. My name is Neil Garg. I am the current department chair and I've been a professor here since 2007. My specialty is organic chemistry, so I teach organic chemistry classes, and I have a, a fairly large uh, laboratory here on the campus. And fun fact, I'm also faculty in residence, so I live in the dorms with my uh, wife and our four children. And I hope, you know, very sincerely to have the chance to meet one person, whether that be on the east side of campus over in chemistry and biochemistry or on the area around the hill whenever uh, you know, things resume or if you're already living here on campus. I wanted to take a second just to say um, how exciting of a time it is here at UCLA in the department. If you haven't heard, I hope you've heard this already, but UCLA was recently ranked the number one public university in the USA again by uh, US News and World Report. So I hate to tell those folks up north at Berkeley, but we just beat them again. So you've made the right choice by um, coming here to UCLA and, and to our department. And um, our department, I'll say, you know, we, um, we're a pretty ambitious place. It's, uh, it's viewed as a, a pretty strong department across the world, both when it comes to research and teaching. And uh, I was looking up some of the statistics about the department that are, I think, pretty awesome. One is that the whole UCLA campus, I think, has 14 or 15 Nobel Prizes. Seven of those come from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry from faculty and alumni. So a lot of our students will go off and, uh, you know, obviously they'll do great things here in the department, but they'll go off and do even bigger things later. Four met, uh, national members of sciences, 12 national academy members, and when it comes to teaching, 24 faculty members have received uh, what's called the Distinguished Teaching Award from the campus. So uh, you come to the right place. Um, it's, a, it's a really great time to be here. We are very much committed to providing each of you with the support and resources um, you may need, and I hope you will consider me personally as one of the many resources you have here at UCLA. 
So for today, we have a pretty fun and um, you know relatively casual event planned to welcome you. We're going to start off with a, a panel discussion, and then from there, we will um, from the breakout rooms. We have the chance to chat more informally with panels that are here. So I thought we can jump right into it, and maybe we can um, take a moment to have each of the panelists introduce themselves. Uh, let's see, I can come up with something here on the spot. So maybe I'll start with um, Professor Jorge Torres. Uh, Jorge, can you tell us a little bit about um, your specialty, what you teach, a little bit about your background? Maybe, um, maybe you can throw in something about anything positive that's come out of um, the pandemic. You know, I think a lot of people are hating on the pandemic just like I am, but there are, of course, positives to everything. And maybe you can reflect a little bit on that. Yeah, welcome everybody. Yeah, we're really happy to uh, have you here in this session. Um, as Neil mentioned, I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. I'm in the Biochemistry Division. My lab works on the mechanisms of human cell division, looking at the proteins and enzymes that are critical for this process and also trying to design small molecule inhibitors to these proteins as potential uh, cancer therapeutics. So we work with human cells, we work with chemicals, we work with chemical biology, um, a little bit of everything in the lab. And, um, you know, uh, something that has been good for me for the pandemic, uh, actually we've been very productive, surprisingly. Um, it has allowed us to reflect on our work, catch up on a lot of the data analysis and writing of manuscripts and papers and things like that. So we've gotten a lot done in, in that area and also just applying for other grants to bring in more funding for the department. So we've been uh, very busy and trying to stay as productive as we can. Awesome, thanks Jorge. Maybe we can turn to um, Nancy and Lita. Um, can you introduce yourselves? And again, if you have anything um, positive that's come out of the, the pandemic on the optimistic side, because we're the optimists at UCLA. Uh, <laughs> share some of that as well. Well, hi, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate you all for getting into UCLA. Like Professor Garg said, we're the number one public institution in our country, which I'm very proud to be to be part of. But I'm Nancy Davis. I graduated with a biochemistry degree in 1976, which that ages me now. Uh, <laughs> best time of my life at UCLA. I went on to get my master's degree at another university in biochemistry and worked in industry for a few years as a supervising chemist and then ended up in a family business. I own a, an insurance agency, but also our son graduated biochemistry degree at UCLA in 2012. And he's gone on to do other things too, but we can talk about that later in a session. So um, just welcome. I'm really proud of you and excited for you at the same time. As far as the pandemic, um, I, yeah, I've had to reflect a lot on my life and just doing extracurricular activities that I always wanted to do. I, I'm reading books now. I'm, do, I'm doing actually taking classes online at UCLA. So I'm having fun with that. Great. My turn? Okay. Uh, uh, I'm Larry Davis. Uh, I also graduated UCLA uh, with a degree in biochemistry and 1977 and a master's in biological chemistry from the School of Medicine at UCLA in 1979. Uh, I was fortunate enough to meet Nancy in physical chemistry. Uh, and uh, I guess we had some of that. So <laughs> we got married three weeks after graduation and uh, we've been married for 43 years. Uh, I had a very short stint as a, as a chemist with a small company in Oklahoma and uh, but otherwise i went into financial services and then to the practice of law i've been an estate planning attorney for 35 years uh optimistic things well let's see nancy and i have been married for 43 years we're in confinement together and we haven't hired a family law attorney to file for divorce so i guess that's a very optimistic thing to be to be looking at right now but uh, congratulations to everyone who got into UCLA, it is really, really difficult and you've done a great job. Good, good job. All right, thanks so much, Larry and Nancy. And then our final panelist, is, um, Dr. Anna Fisher. So Anna, can you introduce yourself, please? And uh, similarly, if you would like to offer any encouragement or share anything optimistic 
Um, looking forward uh, during the craziness of the pandemic, I'm sure people would love to hear it. I'm glad to do that. Um, again, um, I'm Dr. Anna Fisher, and I want to echo what uh, Larry and Nancy said. Congratulations. I only applied to one university, which you know, to, in today's world would probably not be a good thing. So I was very, very lucky, and I'm glad I'm not competing with a lot of the entering freshmen uh, this year, because perhaps I wouldn't have uh, been as lucky. Um, I graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry in 1971. Um, I spent a year in graduate school before going to medical school, because the first time I applied to medical school, I was on the waiting list and, um, you know, a little bit, of course, that was disappointing at the time, but it actually turned out to be a really wonderful experience. I loved the, the year I spent in the chemistry department at UCLA and um, as a result was awarded my master's from that. But then I was uh, successful in getting into medical school the second time I applied, graduated in seven, 1976. And while I was doing my internship, um, found out serendipitously that NASA was looking um, for uh, astronauts for this new space shuttle, which had not flown yet. I applied and was very fortunate to be selected in that first class of astronauts. And so I really um, did not get to go on and, and be actually a practicing chemist or a physician other than for that for a year or so. But um, I really feel that I was very, very fortunate. I, I flew on Space Shuttle Discovery in 1984. And, um, and then I'm happy to tell you more about all of that uh, at a later time, if you like. I retired in April of 2017 and um, has been surprisingly <laughs> as busy as I was before, just uh, doing uh, different things. Um, positive things from the pandemic, number one, my Younger daughter is now pregnant with our second, my second grandchild, my first grandson. Um, and then, uh, so that that's a, a real positive. The second positive is I finally learned how to cook. Um, actually didn't like it. <laughs> so I guess that's some practical chemistry there. And, um, and, uh, and I've also learned a lot about how to um, do virtual talks and stuff. So, it's actually on the negative side. I still have not cleaned out my closets and I still um, have not cleaned out my storage units, which has been on my to-do list <laughs> since the beginning of this. But with that, again, congratulations and uh, welcome to UCLA. You're really lucky. Awesome. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Nancy and Larry. Um, yeah, appreciate you sharing your, your background and some, um, I guess, <laughs> some positive thoughts there about the, the pandemic and some maybe some stuff on the to-do list for Anna um, for cleaning clean, cleaning out. Yeah, I just try to get by, but um, you know, I'll say that I didn't I didn't mention anything about this, but yeah, we've um, I've I've enjoyed the pandemic in terms of just having time to to think more. I I usually have so many meetings running around in different parts of campus. It's been nice to just have a little bit of um, quiet time and also to pursue some hobbies. So Anna, I join you in. Um, cooking. I've definitely been enjoying that. And I had a really good friend, a long, uh, you know, some years ago, who used to say, you, there's no such thing as a chemist who can't cook. So um, that's what I tell myself before I go into the kitchen, just to get myself amped up. So we can go ahead and transition into um, a little bit of panelist discussion. So um, what we've done here is we've given our panelists a couple of prompts. And I'll, I'll tell you what those are um, for everybody. And we'll, we'll we call on them randomly and see what they would like to contribute. But for the uh, everybody attending, here are the prompts that we asked the panelists. One of them is to is tell us about a personal value that you hold dear and that helped you get to where you are today. Another is tell us about a time when you accomplished something, even though you initially doubted your ability to succeed. And another is tell us about a time when you initially felt like you did not fit in and then eventually found your place. And so uh, I can ask for volunteers. Do any of the panelists want to start off or should I? Uh, this is kind of fun. I can put you on the OK, go for it, Nancy. I'm going to take your last question, um, the sense of belonging question. I was incredibly shy when I started UCLA because I had just turned 17 three weeks before entering UCLA. So I was on the young side. And I didn't have any high school friends that 
that I knew had gone to UCLA. So I was sort of on my own, had to kind of navigate the universe, this huge university because I came from a small private school and it was, it was difficult at first, but I made friends. But the one thing the the time that stands out in my mind is when I, finally in my junior year and i don't know why i waited so long was to go to office hours and dr jordan who is a professor of biochemistry at ucla i don't know if any of you the two of you know him but i got the courage to go to his office hours oh my god i should have done it before he was so nice he was encouraging he helped me out I, this is the one thing I would tell all of you is to really take advantage of office hours. Even the TAs are willing to help, but he encouraged me. He even encouraged me to, to uh, go off to graduate school and get my master's degree. And so that was the one sense of belonging. I finally felt like I had arrived at UCLA and I knew where my, my future, well, at least where I was headed. And so that would be the one thing that I would suggest to everybody is to take advantage of meeting your professors don't wait till your junior year like i did and um, take advantage of all of it so that's one of my things awesome yes yes nancy i can um, just add a comment about that for office hours many of you will um you know face this challenge during the pandemic where of course the classes are all online and um you know i, I think it just creates challenges so be aware of that those interactions with the faculty and your classmates, they can be incredibly helpful. And um, it's hard to do it over Zoom. But I think if you can turn on your camera when you're in classes, go to office hours and turn on your camera, get to know them, that way the professor sees the face. And then one day when the pandemic's over, hopefully you'll have the chance to meet face to face and, and then continue to build um, that relationship. Uh, Larry, do you want to chime in on that point or a different one? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on a, a different approach. Uh, uh, Professor Garg, I'm going to talk about your first prompt about uh, values uh, because I think that they're important. And that most of you, although right now you're at home, maybe most of you are at home because you're learning remotely, but there will come a day, hopefully very soon, where you will be moving into Westwood or on campus. And the foundation that you take with you are the family values that that you've been brought up uh, with. Hopefully you've been brought up with good family, family values and that foundation will serve you well in a couple areas. First, tell the truth. Lying takes too much energy. You're not gonna have that much extra time. Do the right thing and you'll be just fine. The second thing is probably even more important than that or just as important and that's you're going to be in a situation, I'm sure the professors put students in study groups uh, and you're going to have uh, you're going to have to cooperate and collaborate with other people. So your word is your bond. If you're going to tell somebody I'm going to get to this or I'm going to provide this or I'm going to give you this information, do it. Make a commitment to be true to that because you're not in this alone you're gonna have a lot of people that you're gonna collaborate with uh, where you're gonna have to hold up your end. And if you're true to that, where you don't let people down, you will be very successful. And you'll find over the years, even well after UCLA, that those two things, telling the truth and uh, 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 doing things that you promise people you will do will serve you well throughout your entire lifetimes. So that's, that's the area I wanted to touch on, uh, Professor. Thanks, Larry. You know, uh, one follow-up point to that is um, I'll often have students work on team-driven assignments. And I also, in addition to the things that um, you suggested, I remind them to compromise. You know, here we we take uh, all the brightest students in California and other parts of the country and the world, and we put them in classrooms and ask them to come up with um, ideas and work on things together. People will have different opinions on things, and they're all very bright and all have very valid ideas. And so part of those team exercises I find is the exercise of having all these very, you know, extraordinarily bright students just compromise and learning to work together. And this is, of course, a lifelong skill that everybody should be um, should in, be practicing. In the comments this morning at, uh, for uh, Justice Ginsburg being uh, laid in, in state in the Capitol, one of the people who spoke about her said, it's OK to disagree. Just don't be disagreeable. 
Exactly. Thank you. All right. So um, maybe we will go to Anna. Anna, would you like to uh, choose one of the prompts from earlier? Anyone in particular? Uh, yeah, well, there, there's two things I'd like to say. Uh, one on the first one about values and things that have helped you. And the one thing that I love to remind uh, young students is to be persistent. If you really, if there's something you really want, I wanted to be an astronaut from the time I was 12 years old, but uh, at the time I was 12 years old and I listened to Al Shepard launch in 1961, that certainly didn't seem like a very realistic goal for pretty much anyone and certainly not for uh, a young girl. Um, but the, the seed was planted and um, I had no idea how I would get there or if I would get there, but I never lost sight of that. Um, when I finally applied to, to UCLA, you know, it was a very intimidating environment at first, and and I can talk about that a bit more. But but then um, when I finally applied to medical school, in the back of my mind was the idea, well, maybe I won't be an astronaut, but maybe I can be a doctor on a space station someday. So I guess the thought I would leave with you is to, that um, uh, to be persistent. If there's something you really want, you know, you maybe don't get it exactly the way you thought of it. Um, I was very fortunate in that my original dream did come true. Um, but um, I've seen so many people who want to, that love space and space exploration, and there's many other uh, avenues for pursuing that. And then the um, other thing I'd like to comment is on um, growth and transformation, your second point about, because um, when I went to UCLA, much like Nancy, I was incredibly shy and, um, you know, by that time, I really didn't think being an astronaut was a, a realistic goal. But um, if I had known speaking in public and talking like this was a requirement, I think I probably would have been way more frightened of that than launching on the shuttle. Um, starting at UCLA, it was very scary because um, I, I had my father was in the military. We moved um, so many times that eighth grade in San Pedro was my 13th school. Um, so I really didn't have a lot of self-confidence, but I knew I loved math. I knew I loved science. And, um, and surprisingly, even back in those early days, the early 70s, the chemistry department at UCLA um, was very welcoming. And quickly, you found a little area of, of the university um, where you felt at home. But still, um, I would say I was very unsure and tentative. And then that year in graduate school, slowly, as you succeed more, you take tests and you do well at UCLA, maybe you're not, as uh, Neil was saying, you're, there's gonna be a lot of smart people at UCLA and maybe you're used to getting straight A's and maybe you're not going to get straight A's anymore, but still you, you do well and uh, slowly your confidence starts to increase. And then as a graduate student and the teaching assistant and giving a seminar to all these amazing professors in the chemistry department, slowly your confidence builds. And then when I went to medical school, same thing, you're starting over at the bottom in a highly competitive environment. And you really wonder, I certainly wondered inside myself that I have what it takes to succeed. And then slowly you start doing your rotations and you uh, finally you know, feel like you are indeed becoming a doctor. And then again, when I got selected as an astronaut, it was the same thing. I'm thinking, oh, man, what have I gotten myself into? Can I really do this? And again, just very slowly, step by step, you learn the, the technical parts of it. You learn the other parts of the job. And as they put you into these more and more challenging situations that finally, by the time you go to launch, and I was operating the robotic arm on my flight, you finally realize you do have those skills, but it's a very long process. So I guess the bottom line of what I'm saying is, um, you know, have confidence. Um, you were selected out of a large number of people and everyone who selected you thinks you have what it takes to succeed. So believe in yourself. And when you have these doubts, you know, there's that song about, um, uh, what was it from, the movie, the, the King and I about, you know, whistling when you're afraid or something and just just go ahead and act like you know what you're doing. And then the, the pretty soon you'll you'll it, you, you will become what you're what you think you're pretending to be. So good luck to all of you. 
Sure. Thanks, Anna. You know, on that note, um, there's a, a really great TED talk on this. May I'll put it in the chat in just a moment. If people might like to hear it. that as I think similar sentiments to some of the things that uh, Anna was describing that I think some of the students might enjoy. Um, Jorge, we're running pretty short on time. Would you mind picking one and um, being, uh, let's say, concise? Sorry, I've been talking too much. So. Yeah, no. So this is going to be really hard because, you know, Larry, Nancy and Anna really hit on some really important uh, uh, things that I wanted to say also um, that are very, very similar. Um, you know, things that, that I would, you know, from my own uh, experience, you know, the imposter syndrome is obviously one thing that always plays in your mind. And, uh, you know, some some of the panelists already talked about you're coming into a highly competitive environment and not feeling that you're as good as your your, your colleagues, your, your mates, um, and, uh, you know, how do you do well within that pressure and uh, within that sort of system? Um, and I think that, you know, with time, getting to be immersed into the coursework, getting to be immersed into the environment, I think that all that helps to understand that everybody is basically going through the same thing and everybody thinks that they might not be good enough. Um, and that you share very similar concerns and experiences with other students at UCLA. Um, the truth is you're all very talented. Um, and you should always keep that in mind, um, that if you set your mind to something, you can really accomplish it. So that's that's the important thing to, to consider here. Thanks, Jorge. And, you know, I, I, I just want to again echo that um, we're all here to support you. So please keep that in mind and use us as resources. You Everybody, thanks so much for attending this event. We're really excited to have you here and to welcome you as new UCLA students to the Division of Physical Sciences and the Department of Mathematics. Now, I'm sure all of you saw, but according to US News and World Report, UCLA is the number one ranked public university in the nation. I mean, this is fantastic. Again. So, and we've received more applications than any other institution in the country. And so admissions were very, very competitive. Congratulations to all of you. You should view this as a testament to our, our knowledge that you're gonna do great here. So we, we very strongly believe that all of you are gonna be able to succeed and we're committed to helping ensure that that happens. So through town halls and things like this, we're working to to provide space to introduce you to the division and to tell you a little bit about ourselves. So my name is Mike Hill. I'm a professor here in the math department. I study what's called algebraic topology. So I try to understand spaces and shapes using algebra. And then I'm also the undergraduate vice chair. So if you have questions about the undergraduate program or you want to know more about what it's like to be a math major, anything like that, that I'm one of the people that you can talk to. In addition to myself, we have several other faculty, alums, students, everybody here to welcome you and answer your questions. So I'd like to ask our panelists to briefly introduce themselves. Um, Natalie, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, hi, my name is Natalie. Um, I am a third year applied mathematics major um yeah <laughs> awesome thanks natalie mario would you like to go next sure hello uh, my name is mario bonk i'm a professor in the math department so my research specialty is complex analysis geometry i'm currently the chair of uh, the department hopefully in my last year but we will see <laughs> i see Hope springs in new. Uh, Davida, would you like to go next? Sure. My name is Davida Milo. I'm an alumni. I graduated with a degree in applied mathematics and a computer specialization. And after I graduated, I went to work for, um, they're now called Accenture, a global consulting firm, where I worked on business systems consulting in a space called customer relationship management primarily for about 10 years. Then I went to work for a client in financial services uh, headquartered in Newport Beach, PIMCO, uh, and led their global CRM practice, the, the software platform and its development. Um, I left there in 2015 and registered an LLC in 2016, and I've done some part-time consulting engagements in Orange County since then. And I'm a member of uh, 
the Board of Advisors for the Division of Physical Sciences. So I have been truly, truly uh, blessed and pleased to be involved with UCLA as an alumni. Awesome. Well, thank you for participating in this too for us. But, and Katie, how about you? Hi, my name is Katie. Um, I am a UCLA alumni. I graduated with a degree in applied mathematics uh, in 2014. So a lot of applied math here, which I love. Uh, and I, uh, upon graduation, went to work for a company called Uber and I've been there ever since. I work on their safety and insurance analytics team doing all sorts of um, data work for them. Awesome. Well, thank you all. So right now I'd like to give our panelists the opportunity to share some advice or to talk about some of their experiences. And this is uh, there to, to help you succeed in your journey as a UCLA student. Prior to today's event, we shared three prompts with our panelists and we asked them to come prepared to talk about them. Um, so panelists, would you prefer that uh, single you out with a prompt or would you like that? Okay, sure. all right, there we go. Um, Katie, could you please tell us about a personal value that you hold dear and that helped you get to where you are today? Uh, so I'll tweak it. I think there's three values that I kind of, if you will. Um, one of them is curiosity and just, um, Continually being curious, whether that's um, in the classroom, in work, in life, um, there's so much to learn. And um, having that inquisitive mindset has been really helpful in trying to dissect and understand um, the things going on uh, in the world and anywhere else that you're um, exposed to. I think the second one for me is also impact. Um, I really like feeling like the work that I'm doing um, is having a, a positive impact on broader society. So. Um, that was really helpful in navigating, uh, especially in applied mathematics, what kinds of challenges I really wanted to tackle and um, understand and try to solve. Um, and the third one is balance. I think that it's very easy, especially as you jump right into your freshman year of college, um, to go one, you know, jump all the way into um, you know, the social scene or academics or, you know, there's learning curves across the board. And so kind of keeping balance top of mind um, was really helpful for me to um, really make sure that I was kind of keeping true to myself um, and that I was kind of keeping my own personal health um, and the health of my relationships with others um, top of mind as well. Thank you, Katie. I, I especially liked the the emphasis on balance and in this time, I feel like it's all the more important to, to be mindful of what is it you need? How do you make that fit with all the other demands on your time? So thank you very much yeah, for sharing these. Especially when your whole world is one room, right? <laughs> yeah, so it, it becomes very important to, to create those boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, Davida, same question. Uh, could you tell us about a personal value that you hold dear and that helped you get to where you are today? Okay, so uh, I have a kind of a handful that I was thinking about. I would say that I came to UCLA with a lot of personal resolve and feeling very principled about authenticity and integrity and uh, a practical mindset to a certain extent. I came from a household in high school where I was uh, finishing high school with a single parent and I was on federal student aid when I came to UCLA. I was determined to get a degree that I enjoyed, but that would be a useful tool to me going forward into my career. Midway through college, uh, when I was a junior, UCLA introduced something called a specialization in computing uh, certificate which I think they might offer as a minor now. And the advisor in mathematics recommended that I add that to my list. So even though that meant having to extend my graduation date and I was on financial services, or I'm sorry, financial aid, so I didn't, I didn't take that lightly, she recommended that it would be highly useful. I had done some of the prerequisites by virtue of my applied mathematics major, but it required a lot of programming courses to be added. So I, I went into that and those were 
resource intensive. Those were courses that required a lot of time and completed that certification. And that was probably the best advice anyone had given me in college in terms of a tool that unlocked doors for me in the future. So I think being practical and, and focused on where there was the blend of my interests and, and determination gave me an access to, uh, gave me the access to interview with so many more appealing employers when I was graduating that would not have been accessible to me in the system without that degree. I went on, like I said, to work for Accenture. I didn't want a career in programming, but understanding the interpretation, the translation between trying to do business processes in a computing construct helped me as I became a manager at that firm and was leading teams in large implementations. So I think those traits and that opportunity at UCLA really was a launch pad for me in my future that I appreciate to this day. Awesome, thank you. Um, so Mario, could you tell us about a time when you accomplished something even though you initially doubted your ability to succeed? Well, you know, in, <laughs> in math, you have to have a very high uh, tolerance for frustration. <laughs> You know, if you are trying to prove a theorem, I mean, 99% of the things that you try don't work, right? But if you uh, bang your head against the wall for long enough, you know, sometimes you do succeed. I have a very interesting story of one of my recent PhD students. You know, I gave him a project and he didn't get anywhere, you know, for three years. Of course, you know, he did all the things that he should do, you know, study the background, study the relevant literature, try this, try that. And finally, you know, he was able actually to solve the problem. Right. So I, this, this is a really amazing a success story. Sometimes it happens, you know, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but, you know, in, in mathematics, I think, you know, you have to be patient. You have to be curiosity driven. I think this is a very important virtue. That Katie mentioned, and you know, if if you keep up this curiosity and keep up the hard work, you know, you will succeed. Awesome! I really like that 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 take also on perseverance rather than just the assumption that like, oh, if I'm going to do math, it's just going to all come to me. I'm just going to see everything the whole time, and it's going to be easy. But that's not the way it is for for any of us doing it. You'll have times where it's just hard, it's just a lot of work. And yeah, let me just talk about this. Yeah, exactly, this perseverance. This is very, very uh, important, you know, and I can only tell the new students, I mean, don't get discouraged if something is hard. You know, if you're learning proofs and it's hard, I mean, it took uh, humankind literally hundreds of years to get to this stage, right? And now you're supposed to learn it in one quarter. This is almost impossible, right? So don't get discouraged but keep up the good work. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, Natalie, same question to you. Could you tell us about a time when you accomplished something, even though you initially doubted your ability to succeed? Yeah, so um, my answer is actually kind of similar. Um, so I recently started taking the upper division classes and all of the classes I've taken so far have been um, focused on writing proof. So going into it, that was something that I kind of thought like, how am I ever gonna learn how to do this? It's kind of one of those things that there isn't really a step-by-step -step way of learning it. You just kind of have to be thrown into it and then figure it out, trial and error. Um, so I kind of um, told myself that if I wanted badly enough to be successful in that class, then um, I would do what it takes to be successful. So um, I spent a lot of time looking up proofs online and um, even things that weren't necessarily related to uh, what I was learning in that class, but just kind of seeing how different people write out different things and explain these basic concepts that we just kind of like take as fact um and writing and rewriting those same proofs over and over to find different ways that you could come to the same answer um and i got discouraged a lot um
Oops. Natalie, I believe your audio cut out. <laughs> well, let me know. Let me know when it comes back. But I think you, you bring up a really fantastic point too, though, and that is the way something's explained in class and the way you see it in the book, these are several of many, many different ways that you can approach any problem. And sometimes they're not the ways that speak to you. Basically, I wasn't getting the grades I wanted on my homeworks and on my um, quizzes and, and stuff. Um, and I had a big turning point when I realized math is you know, a really wide discipline. And um, like it was mentioned earlier, not everyone is gonna be great at every single aspect and it is a lot of work um, and kind of realizing that um, being smart isn't necessarily understanding a problem right as soon as you get it, but more so having the determination um, and the kind of outlook of the long-term problem um, and being able to put in the work and the time to find the solution in the end. And then I think that that makes us better mathematicians and better students, um, more so than just understanding the problem right away. I agree completely. Thank you. That was that was really well put. Um, I guess I'll I'll answer one of the prompts, um, and I'll and I'll describe a time when I initially felt like I didn't fit in, but eventually found space. Um, so all through undergrad, in addition to studying math, I was very involved in LGBT activism. Uh, as a gay man, I didn't feel like there were a lot of other people that I saw in my classes who I also would then see at rallies at various events. And that that felt pretty isolating for me. And And for a while, I felt like I had to do things like code switch or present myself differently if I was in a math space rather than in an LGBT, uh, LGBT space. And, and it, took, it took a fair amount of time, but eventually I realized that the other mathematicians I was dealing with were, were fine either way. And I didn't have to do that kind of switching. And then by not switching, by just being my authentic self in all of the environments that I could be, it helps make space for other people to also feel like they can be their authentic selves. So if you're not seeing yourself necessarily uh, represented in your classes or the ways you are, this is, uh, I hear you and I understand. And it can be, it can be hard to first break through that, but then it can also be rewarding. Um, I think we have at least a few more minutes with this part. Um, Davida, would you like to, to answer the same prompt? To tell us about a time you felt initially like you didn't fit in and then found your place. Sure, sure. So uh, when I went to UCLA, unlike a lot of California students, uh, nobody from my high school was coming to UCLA. So I came truly not knowing anybody. I had graduated from high school in Miami, Florida and moved across the country to attend school here and felt, definitely experienced a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, in my first quarter where I felt I didn't have connections, I didn't have deep friendships. And of course, this is in a context of being able to be in person. So I have a great deal of empathy for this year's class. And I would implore you to do something outside of your comfort zone, to reach out to strangers amongst your classmates uh, amongst people that are incoming freshmen, even if it feels awkward to try to create the new normal of meeting somebody in this virtual enterprise because we're here for a long while. But I had the advantage of uh, three places that really gave me an open window to develop things. One of them was the residence halls. So if you have the chance once school resumes in person to live on campus, even though you'll feel like a sardine, in those tiny rooms with three people and you'll have a, maybe a 10 by four space for you and your belongings, there, there's, it's an immeasurable experience in terms of building bonds with people 
who become your lifelong friends. And with a resident assistant who runs programming that helps grease the skids to bring people together so there's less required of maybe a nervous incoming freshman, doing events together, having meals together as a young adult in that new free uh, construct of not living in your parents' house anymore, I'd encourage you to do it. There are there are a group of people and their spouses and their children who we see, and I met my husband in Hedrick Hall, I'll confess, so we're college sweethearts too. We see each other all the time, even though we're in New York, we're in Northern California and Santa Barbara, we see each other all the time. These will be your lifelong extended family. Um, another area that was super was really the math major department because there for, despite the disciplines that you might go into, there are, there's a lot of commonality, those initial calculus courses and physics courses and chemistry courses that you take. So you'll see the same faces if you get to see them in a classroom or when you're in person, you'll see the same people over and over in those. And if you can get yourself to extend that first introduction, again, those people became my study friends who helped me through some of the difficult problems that Mike was talking about where if the professor didn't say it in a way that was clear to me, my friends could re-explain it to me. We could do homework together. And again, lifelong friends, one of them was visiting me this weekend who 30 years ago I met because she was crying over her first test score in calculus outside of the building. And I went over to a stranger to console her and she's one of my best friends now. So I would say, look where you're seeing repeated faces. I know it's harder in this construct, but you won't regret it. You won't regret the effort. You will be grateful. Fantastic point. Thank you for, thank you. Thank you all of our panelists for, for sharing your experience, sharing your thoughts. Hello everyone. I'm sorry that we can't see you by the way, but uh, we'll introduce ourselves to you in a moment and, they, and get to know you in the breakout room. Uh, thank you for attending this event. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, we're really happy to have you all here and welcome you as new UCLA students. It's really exciting. And uh, to the Division of Physical Sciences. Um, and to the, in our case, the, here the Department of Physics and Astronomy. So according to US News World Report, we're really excited about this. We are once again, for the fourth year in a row, the number one ranked public university in, in the country. And we used to share that with Berkeley, but not anymore. We are just number one alone and move over Berkeley. Uh, we actually received more applications than any other institution in the country. Uh, and the admissions is very competitive. So I hope you're proud of yourselves. I do watch those YouTube clips of UCLA students opening their acceptance letters. But I know that how that goes. And the fact that you're here tells us that you are very accomplished already in your young lives and that you have tremendous future potential. Uh, and we all really believe in you. We know that you can succeed at UCLA. We're here to help you. Uh, we're here to provide you the support and the resources necessary. We can get you in the right direction if you ever have a question. So who am I? Who is this crazy guy who's talking? I am uh, David Salzberg, and I am the chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And we are going to go around, and you can see the names of every person here. But why don't we just start um, with Laura and tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll go around. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Marchand, um, and I graduated from UCLA in 2010 with a bachelor's degree in physics of so 10 years ago. Um, and since I graduated, I've been working in a company called Emmy Engineers, um, which is in the building design and construction industry. So I'm an electrical engineer, and my day to day job is kind of similar to what an architect does create blueprints for buildings um, that then are used to build them in the field, but instead of the walls and doors were designing the electrical systems, um, fire alarm systems, lighting systems. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit about me and what I do now. Great, we uh, like to get to know our alumni. And at the other end of our spectrum, we have an undergraduate student, Tamar, introduce herself, please. Hi, um, I'm Tamar. I'm a rising third year and I'm majoring in astrophysics and I'm minoring in atmospheric and oceanic sciences and math. 
um, along with school, I'm a learning assistant in the physics department. And I'm also vice president of finance in my sorority. And I work for a tutoring company here in LA, as well as interning for a government contractor in San Diego, where I do solar physics research, which is kind of what I am interested in pursuing in the future. But yeah, so if you have any questions pertaining to classes or anything like that, I would be happy to answer them. Great, thank you. And we'll move on to Professor Andrea Guez, please. So I am a professor in the department. Uh, I, my research, I specialize in astrophysics and in particular studying black holes. Um, I've been at UCLA for 26 years uh, and you'll find me most often teaching Astro 81, which is Introduction to Astronomy and Astrophysics. Thank you. And Professor Graciela Gelmini. So um, I'm professor of physics too. Uh, I'm originally from Argentina, so probably you can hear my accent. Um, I, my research area is uh, elementary particle physics, but in connection with astrophysics and cosmology, there is a core okay. area of interface. And we, at, at, at the physics department, we teach all sorts of things. So this coming year, I'm going to, talk, to teach for um, upper division, but uh, you know, we, 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 we change. So who knows, in a few years, uh, you, may, you may have me at one of your courses. Thanks, Graciela. I probably should say a few words about myself when I'm not being chair. I am a particle physicist. I work at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, which is the uh, world's biggest atom smasher. And I also do particle physics work in Antarctica. So if you want to travel guide, I can help you with that. So I think we're ready to move on to some tough questions for the panelists. OK. So, and I'll just open up to whoever wants to, uh, uh, of the four of you that want to answer. Um, could you tell us about a personal value that you hold dear and that helped you get to where you are today? Uh, I, I can take that. Yes, yeah. um, well, I think that persistence um, is, is maybe first. Um, but I think persistent uh, matched up with, with curiosity, interest. So follow your beliefs, do what you are most interested in, and then pursue it. Don't don't be discouraged because we all make mistakes and have to learn from our mistakes and our you know little bumps in the road. So persistence, but match up with follow your beliefs. Thanks. Anyone else want to talk? We have other options. Anyone else want to tell us about a personal value or? Oh yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, yep, thanks, Laura. Well, we don't hear you. I think you might have to unmute. Right, yeah, I muted myself because I was afraid of background noise. Mm -hmm. and I um, so mine was also I persistence as well. Um, I feel like that served me particularly well when I was an undergrad because um, undergrad was kind of the first time I really struggled with academic material and I struggled a lot in the physics classes. Um, but I didn't give up. I went to office hours all the time um, and I found that all of my professors were extremely approachable. Everyone really just wants to help you learn and master the material and enjoy the material. Um, I also kind of had to relearn how to study as compared to how I studied in high school. But I just felt like being really persistent and kind of not giving up until I really understood something or really mastered something was so key to being successful in classes. And so that's something I encourage everyone to have. Like, it's totally okay if you don't understand something the first or second or third time. Just keep trying and you'll get there. That's great. That's really important. If I were going to weigh in on what I wish I had done better, it would have been uh, as an undergrad. It would have been to really understand things at every step and really kind of, you know, be honest with yourself about what you understand it thing. Because in physics and astronomy, things are really one thing builds on another, which is wonderful. But it does mean you have to have each step well in place to appreciate them. Okay, why don't we move on? Um, what's uh, one of you like to tell us about a time that you 
accomplish something, even though you initially thought you would you doubted it. You thought you might not succeed. I'll go ahead. I have an example um, that I find somewhat ironic. Um, well, David might find ironic, actually. Um, so when I was an undergraduate, the thing I feared most was public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Just what I do a lot of today. I think you probably could have knocked me over <laughs> with a feather if you told me that I would become a professor at um, the time. What I did know, as you know, but at some point, is that I wanted to be a physicist. And so, in the process of trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I thought teaching was no way because I didn't like speaking. But I I realized at some point that no matter pretty much almost anything I was thinking about required me um, to speak. So I ended up do, um, trying to TA um, in, over to, in order to overcome my fear of public speaking. And what I discovered in the process of um, TAing is actually that I had a tremendous passion for teaching. So it was something that I couldn't see because of a fear. So I guess in all of this, it's um, I like to think of doing things that you love and also always pushing your um, always also trying something that that scares you a little bit um, because you may discover something that you actually have tremendous passion for by trying something new. Great. Thank you. Was one of you also with someone else that could talk about a time you accomplished something even though you doubted doubted it to start with. I had an amazing postdoc. That's what you do after you get your PhD. Believe it or not, even after, after you get a PhD, you, uh, you're not done. <laughs> she was so amazing because we sometimes took on tasks and we were like, there's no way this is gonna work, but we just, she had this ability to, to try it. Yet we had the time, we had the resources. We did, and it's amazing how often it worked. It really came together. That always surprised me. And so I learned from her. Uh, that just starting and trying something, uh, it, it's kind of shocking what you can get done. Okay, so we're going to go to another next question. We might, tomorrow might, might hit the next question first. Would you like to tell us about a time when you initially felt like you didn't fit in, but then eventually found your place? Sure, yeah. Honestly, I think just the time and or place would just be UCLA in general. Like especially my first physics class, um, it was like physics 1H, which is like intro mechanics. Mm -hmm. And I'm not very good at mechanics and like everyone else in my class seemed to be very good at mechanics. So it was kind of like, not frustrating, but like very intimidating, I guess, to just be surrounded by like all these people that seem to have a hundred percent of an idea of what was going on. And then um, as like the first midterm rolled around, I was like super stressed and like trying to figure out the best way to study and like started studying with some friends I had made like a couple days before the midterm in class. And we realized that like all of us felt the same way that it seemed like everyone else knew what was going on, but honestly, none of us really did. And so just like finding a good group of friends who now I still take all my classes with them. Like we have three classes together this fall. We study together all the time. So I think that was really just like the turning point in realizing that like everyone sometimes feels like they don't belong, especially at a school like UCLA where it's so academically high achieving and competitive. Um, so if I could give any advice, I would say just like find a good study group, even in line, like message someone random on Zoom, like everyone's classes are hard and everyone like wants friends to study and like learn with, but yeah. Thanks. Yeah, you're, one of the main reasons to come to college is because not because of necessarily the professors, but the other students that are at the same level and struggling and learning at the, at the same time. And it was easier in the before time to just look to your left and look to your right in class and say, hey, do you want to get together and study later? It's going to take a, being a little more deliberate about that in the day of, of Zoom. But um, once you find a group of people to work with, I find Zoom quite normal. But you'll have to probably spend a little extra effort 
is finding those people. Um, the way I did it often was just saying, hey, you want to compare answers on the problem set before we hand it in? And then that turned into a discussion of why did you get that answer? I did that with my friend Christina, just because she happened to be on the same floor as me in my dorm in physics, who's the other physics major. Somehow, that was on the East Coast, somehow we both wound up uh, in Los Angeles and uh, she's still my best friend. And in fact, uh, her daughter and her daughters and uh, Professor Gessie's daughters go to school together. So you never know who you meet that first week that you will still be amazing friends with uh, 25 years from now or more. No, I don't, way more than that. <laughs> so. Yeah. And also with um, Zoom, like a lot of the professors will host discussion sections where they'll put you in like um, groups to like work on problems. So especially the first couple of weeks, just showing up to your discussion sections is like another good way to meet people in your classes. If you're like a freshman or a new student. Um, I would like to say that um, <laughs> the first time I, I started, I was given the opportunity of engaging in research. It was already when I left Argentina. I had my first degree after five years of uh, the first degree. You know, the, the study breakup is different. Uh, and so I went to Italy and I found that most people uh, in the program I was following had already done some research and I had done nothing, absolutely nothing. And it was, um, it was really intimidating. So I think that um, one of the advantages that, that, that I see at UCLA in many other places, but at UCLA in particular, that you will encounter is the possibility of engaging in research as an undergraduate. Uh, in, the, in the summer, you have different possibilities. And so you have an exposure of uh, what it is to do research even at this early stage. And, um, and you're better prepared later to decide if you want to go to research or not. But in any case, it's a way of testing this life uh, because you are in a research university in which actually have many, many different possibilities. And also through NSF programs, you can even go other places um, as, a, as an undergraduate. And I think uh, it, it's extremely good if you will use this opportunity section. And um, so I have to try, I mean, and, and, but, but certainly I felt intimidated by that, and by lack, lack of experience. So we just have three minutes left. Uh, did anybody want to say anything uh, to our incoming students before uh, we we meet them in the uh, in the breakout rooms? I would like to say ask many questions because um, many students don't know how the courses are organized, how much help you can get, um, uh, sometimes even how to study. Uh, everything is new, so ask questions. Don't be intimidated. Not knowing is not uh, is not something that you have to be ashamed of. On the contrary, if you start questions, start asking questions early on, uh, then you can use the uh, the experience of other people uh, to help you and, and and get to what you want to do faster. So ask questions yeah. all the time. And. And, 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 and Graciela was talking about physics and astronomy questions, I think. But there's also administrative questions. We have the most amazing person in this department named Dr. Francoise Caval. She's been here 30 years, like nodding. She knows there is no administrative question. And by this point, physics or astronomy question, I think, that she could not answer. So just know, if, if you don't know where to turn, you can, of course, find one of us, but also Francoise Caval. And you can always ask me later how to find her. Uh, she will, will, will put you in the right direction. She always gets the big yeah. applause at graduation. She's very wonderful. I spent a lot of time in her office when I was an undergrad. She like gave me advice when I was trying to pick between job offers right before graduation. We talked about all kinds of stuff. She's really great. I would like maybe to say something else. In particular, if you come from a family in which you don't have any other people who have been in your family or, or among your relatives or somebody who have gone to uh, the university. But that's my case and you can do it. Uh, maybe you need uh, to ask even more questions to know how to plan your time, but, um, but you can do it. Great, Graciela. So let me just 
thank everyone for the their attention. I presume they were paying attention. We don't get to see their faces, but I'm sure they were paying attention. And I want to thank the panelists for sharing their values and experiences. It's not always so easy. Jay Hauser, I'm the vice chair for academics of the physics and astronomy department. And uh, also on our panel is Alice Shapley, who is the vice chair for astronomy. So any questions about astronomy, send them her way. We also have on the panel, uh, Farisa Morales. Uh, Farisa is an alumni of uh, UCLA and um, go Bruins. And uh, so I think we're expecting one more alumnus to to show up. Uh, that will be Tiffany Meshkat. Uh, we hope to hear from her. And we can't see you guys out there, um, but we hope that there are a bunch of you. Um, and we thought just to kick this thing off, we would have uh, a first session of about 20 minutes, and then we would have our different sessions where you can uh, uh, it'll be more interactive. Instead of being like a webinar, it'll be like a Zoom room where you can ask questions and we can talk to you and see you and all that, which would be great. So, um, yeah, we'd like to welcome you as new UCLA students to the Division of Physical Science and the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, well, so according to the U.S. News and World Report, UCLA is once again the number one ranked public university in the U.S., we got more applications than any other institution in the country. And of course, admission is extremely competitive. So the fact that you're with us tells us that you're really accomplished and uh, you have a fantastic future potential. And we expect that uh, all of you can succeed at UCLA and we're here to provide you with all the support and, and the resources that uh, are, are necessary for success. So, um, now, I guess rather than just saying who the other panelists are, maybe you guys can tell us a little bit about yourselves. Uh, David, Alice, and Farisa, do you want to say a few words? In any order? Jay, you just tell us who goes. started. <laughs> David, one. Hi, I'm David Salzberg. I am the chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, I was host last week, but now I get to sit back and relax and just answer questions, which is really nice. And I am an experimental particle physics. I work, in fact, with Jay at the Large Hadron Collider. You may have heard about the discovery of the Higgs boson about eight years ago now, and that's where we work. And this is my friend, Albert. <laughs> I can, uh, I can nice. jump in. Okay, great. Um, so hi, I'm Alice Shapley. I'm the vice chair for astronomy and astrophysics in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. So we have a wonderful, big and diverse department. Um, it's a joint department of physics and astronomy uh, of about 60 faculty um, and the astronomers comprise about a quarter of the faculty. So we're sort of like a sub department within the department. Um, and um, I love the astronomy division so much within the physics and astronomy department. I love our whole department, uh, but we have such a great range of research going on in our department, and I'm very proud to be the vice chair right now. Um, and I personally uh, study galaxy formation. So I study how galaxies like our Milky Way form in the early universe and then evolve through cosmic time up into the current day. And UCLA is a great place to do astronomy because we have access to some of the very best facilities in the entire world um, and also coming up in space. So anyway, looking forward to talking to you more today. Hi, everybody. My name is Farisa Morales. I built my academic foundation at UCLA. I did my undergrad there in astrophysics and I graduated in 2003. I am now a program manager for astrophysics and heliophysics at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And I'm also a planet hunter. That's my area of interest of research. I uh, characterize dust around other stars that form planetary systems and hunt for the planets around those stars. In addition, I'm also a full-time faculty member at Moorpark College and part-time at Cal State Northridge. Thanks, Farisa. Let me say a little bit more about myself. David mentioned that he and I are both experimental particle physicists. And uh, I think when I think about physics and astronomy as a whole, I think you have, uh, you have the best discipline of all time if, of anything you could possibly be doing. Um, because physics and astronomy are both amazing. The fact that 
these uh, laws of nature work everywhere and we can understand our universe uh, mm -hmm. out to, uh, you know, it takes light 14 billion years to reach us from the earliest uh, part of the universe when the Big Bang created it. And we can see that light and we can study it and, uh, and the laws work uh, for every phenomenon on Earth and in the solar system. They work in the cores of stars where it's tens of millions of degrees and, and uh, uh, in neutron stars where I think they tell you stuff like a teaspoonful of neutron star material is like a hundred million tons or something like that. Alice can correct me if I got an order. It's, a, it's equivalent to like the weight of all the people on earth, which is kind of a weird statistic. <laughs> in a teaspoon. Yeah. And you know, it seems to work perfectly in uh, black holes that are merging with each other and you know they they give you uh they, they the first merging black hole discovery with gravitational waves it's just like incredible you try you you have like high numbers like 30 solar mass black hole and a and a 40 solar mass black hole and they merge and three times the mass of our sun disappeared in the form of gravitational radiation energy you know it's just like Incredible stuff, but it all seems to work out because the observations show that. In my own field, it works at, at down to the, the size that's uh, like a 10,000th of the diameter of the proton. And so, you know, it's just a great, great um, field to be studying. It's so powerful. You can study anything and, and understand. So uh, with that having been said, I think we were... Um, we were gonna break the ice a little bit with a few hard questions for our panelists. And here are the three questions. Um, and you can choose which of them you'd like to answer. So one question is, tell us about a personal value that you hold dear and that helped you, helped you get to where you are today. So would any of you like to handle that right off the bat? If that's, if okay, that's good. Great. okay, yeah. Thanks, so, Alan. well, um, so I guess I think probably um, uh, one of the values that I think is really, really important for what we do um, is hard work. Um, but the thing about hard work is that it's it doesn't even feel like hard work if you're doing something that you love, and that's how I feel about research. Is that I'm willing to just like work as hard as I can, especially you know I've got two little kids, so sometimes I have to work like at night, you know. But that's okay because I actually I love what I'm doing so much and um, and I think that, you know, sometimes, um, I think that's one of the things that's so important is like finding your passion so that if you're putting the time and working at it, it's a, still a pleasure. And so I think that's, that's for me, like one of the things that's really important. I'll agree that when you're passionate about something, you're not gonna find it hard work. And that, yeah, so I think that's one of the great things about, about uh, physics and astronomy is that it's true part of, part of I think, doing well and succeeding is working hard, but if you love it and you understand it, that it's so fun, it's it's not a problem. Anyway. Okay, thanks. So here's the second one. Uh, maybe, um, yeah, hey, oh, you want to chime in? Are, yeah. are, are we free to jump in and uh, and add to that or, or should, ahead, should we wait ahead, our turn? Ahead. Okay, so I just wanted to add for me, I would I would say tenacity having tenacity, right? Because there's so many times in my, through my academic trajectory that I doubted myself, that I would, why am I doing this to myself? <laughs> Just like wondering how long is this gonna take, right? We know that, it ha that it's finite, but um, there's a lot of twists and turns that life throws at you, especially because I began my academic career with babies already, so I had my children, and then I went to school. So I had to juggle so many things at the same time. So I think tenacity really is what pulled me through because you're going at it, or at least I was going at it in the blind. So if you just chop it up into pieces and it's one day at a time, even though you may not know what's on the other side, you'll get there, right? Stick with it. <laughs> Talk about imposter sy sy syndrome. In, oh my gosh, uh, yes. You don't feel like you really belong. There are people who are so much smarter and, and there are times when you feel like quitting and, and not not uh, giving up and and really believing in yourself is important of course but that okay that's kind of yeah everything but that. those are all jay no thank you thank you for adding that uh your perception of other people's level of you know how much smarter they are or so on it's just your perception what's really happening you don't really recognize until later 
right? After I graduated, we I get together with my colleagues and say, hey, back then, and then they would say, oh, you were setting the bar. And I'm like, what? That was not me. <laughs> but it's just perceptions, right? It's it's all, we think that everyone else is doing better <laughs> and not necessarily. And I, I think some of the, remember the reason people are coming to UCLA as undergraduates is to be with smart people and learn from them. It's wonderful. <laughs> and don't, and don't it can worry about not first. being the smartest person in the room if you ever think you're not. In fact, that's the terrible place to be because then you're explaining everything to everyone. So uh, you really don't want to be the smartest person in the room. <laughs> you know, I think that's one of the nice things about our department, though. It's a wonderful department. There's first class research going on. And yet I think it's also a really friendly department, you know. So I think that our department works hard to I shouldn't say works hard. I think our department is naturally a place that's actually really friendly and we, we want to be welcoming to everyone and supportive to everyone and mentoring everyone. And it's something that we put at a very high priority in our department mm -hmm. is making sure people feel included. People should know we have the, uh, I might have changed the name, but there was a clubhouse to work on problem sets uh, every afternoon. And we're going to set up ways to make sure that uh, people can find people can find each other. You know, when we all went remote in spring, people already had their friends. And we know that maybe some of you don't know anybody here yet. And uh, normally you would sit down and talk to someone new at a chair next to you and lecture and maybe become friends and work together on a problem set. So we're going to come up with ways to, to make sure that you can uh, work together. And if for some reason you're feeling alone, like it doesn't work, we miss you because it could happen. This is a big logistical thing. Just email me or Jay or Alice and we'll, we'll, we'll use it not only to help you, but we'll find where the hole was and we'll try to plug it. Yeah, let, let me just say that students are, I think they're kids and they have to listen to adults. But in fact, you're in college, you're begin, becoming a, our colleagues. And you'd be surprised at how little we're interrupted by our students in, in the university. Like, it's very rare for a student to contact me out of the blue and just say, you know, I have a problem. It, it just doesn't occupy, I would say, 0.1% of my time. So if that went up by a factor of 10, if you actually, you know, contact professors when you have some, some something where we could help, uh, there could be 10 times as much of it as what goes on right now. And you are special to us. Although right now we're speaking to the ether, we suppose that there are some of you out there um, you guys really are important to us. We graduate between physics and astronomy about a hundred majors per year. And I probably, besides t teaching in classes, I probably only hear from two or three per year. So you can speak up. And if you think something needs to change, um, we're trying to improve our department to be the best in every respect. So we'd love to hear about any suggestions you have. We we certainly don't do th things perfectly, you know, our exam structures or the, 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 the courses sometimes don't mesh perfectly. Any suggestions you have, we're going to listen. So, um, okay, I want to ask one more hard question, if you don't mind. This one I like is um, about fitting in and it's about, uh, tell us about a time when you initially felt like you did not fit in and then eventually found your place. So it's a little bit personal. I don't know if any of our panelists would like to handle that. Farisa or David. David, do you? I'll jump in. Okay. Go ahead, David. Did you want to go say something? Okay, we can just, I went to a uh, East Coast school where there were a lot of kids from private prep schools, which I didn't go to, and they all sort of knew each other and had their ways, and I had never heard of some of the sports that they talked about. But you know what? I felt really great because uh, I knew Maxwell's equations. <laughs> uh, and, and most of them did. And so um, you can feel good about all the stuff that, that you know and you're gonna be learning in the first year. Very nice. Thank you, David, for sharing. Uh, I remember a day that it just kind of hit me. I was uh, first, there were several occasions that I didn't feel I belonged, for example, at UCLA, but um, most of my colleagues did not have children. They didn't have the responsibilities that I had, right? So I couldn't stay for like study groups and things like that. 
Um, so I had my own way of scheduling things, but so that was minor. I was able to overcome that pretty quickly, but there was the one day that, that I had finished finals. And I think emotionally, that's when you give yourself time to like relax and feel like before that you cannot feel, you can just study <laughs> and study, study, study and focus. And when I finished my last final, I walked out of the classroom and I remember feeling outside that I didn't belong. And he's like, what? I just finished my finals week, right? Everything, I poured everything I could from my brain into those papers. And and I started to introspect, why is it that I'm feeling that I don't belong? And it had to do with people of color. Nobody in the classroom was of color. It was the only time I remember feeling that. I went home and my, my voice cracking is like, why, why am I feeling that? And I kept pushing and I'm here today. Interesting. Nice. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Difficult sometimes if you're, you know, you're different from everybody else in the room. Yep. Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Rob Gould. I'm the vice chair of undergraduate studies in the statistics department. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today to, uh, this event uh, which is, uh, from the Division of Physical Sciences in the Department of Statistics, and it's meant to welcome you as new students. Uh, I'm going to give our panelists the chance to introduce themselves in a few minutes, uh, but I just want to say a few words before we get started to get everything going. So as you may have heard, U.S. News and World Report ranked UCLA the number one public university in the U.S., I think, for the fourth year. Now, as statisticians, we hope to teach you to be really critical of... Uh, rankings that take complex institutions and condense them to a single number. But as the institution that came out number one, I think we can just suspend that critical judgment for a while. Uh, one thing it definitely means is that um, you are in a very select group. Uh, I believe the admission rate was well under 15%, the lowest I think it's been ever. So, uh, and UCLA was the most applied to uh, institution in the country this year. So the fact that you're here and, and coming to UCLA speaks tremendously about your potential and uh, about your accomplishments. So we're really excited to have you in our classes. Um, and we believe that each and every one of you are, is going to succeed and we hope to be able to provide you with the resources that you need to be successful. So uh, I told you a little bit who I am. Um, my, I've, I've been here since uh, UCLA since 1994. I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, I have been administering the undergraduate program from a, well, it didn't start until around 2000. So that's since I've been administering it. Uh, my primary emphasis is in uh, statistics education. And one of my pet projects is Data Fest, which I hope you'll all have a chance to participate in someday soon. Um, so in addition to myself, we have uh, one other of my esteemed faculty, uh, Nicholas Christou. I think we'll be joined by Matash Esfandiari too. She's having some technical difficulties, so she may kind of pop up. And we have two, uh, two of our alumni uh, whom I haven't, well, I saw Mallory a year or so ago. I haven't seen Lance in several years, so it's great to have them on. I'm going to um, um, now ask them to kind of briefly introduce themselves and uh, we'll go clockwise on my, screens. So that means starting with Mallory. So just Hi, a sentence or two, please. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Mallory. Uh, I graduated from UCLA statistics department back in 2012. And since then I've done a couple of uh, various data science related work from consulting to now I work at Facebook as a data scientist. Thank you. Uh, Lance. Yeah. Uh, my name is Lance. I also graduated in 2012 from the, the, the statistics department. And um, I know that I, right now, I work for Intuit. Doing a, um, I'm a data, data analyst. Um, I'm hoping to get into a data science role uh, there over the next year. Great, thanks. And now, Nicholas. Thank you, Rob. H hello, everyone. Welcome to UCLA. What a joy to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Nicholas Christou. I've been at UCLA since 2000, so this will be my 21st year. Um, um, I'm, I'm a senior continuing lecturer. I am Greek from Cyprus, if you know, it's a small island in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. So, yeah, thank you. Talk to you soon. Yeah. 
All right, so um, our panelists were given homework. They were given three prompts to respond to. And I'm gonna briefly summarize those prompts. And I think what we'll do is I'll just call on them one at a time and ask them to choose one prompt to respond to. And as we have more time, we can do additional things. So the prompts are, tell us about a personal value that you hold dear and that helped you to get where you are today. Second prompt, tell us about a time when you accomplished something even though you initially doubted your ability to succeed. And the third prompt was, tell us about a time when you initially felt like you did not fit in and then eventually found your place. So uh, let's start with Lance. Which prompt would you like to answer? Jeez, <clears throat> um, those are good. Um, I, I think the, the one that stuck out to me the most was, uh, you know, what, what, what was it? Um, what was, uh, when, when was the time that, that I, I thought that I wasn't, wouldn't be able to do something, but got into it? I feel like, um, so I graduated in 2012, like I said, and I've been in, in different analytical roles um, ever since. And um, I would say almost weekly or monthly, there there are situations where, where I get this feeling that um, I don't know how this is going to be done. I don't know what the answers are. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Um, and that's that's because usually, you know, in, in <clears throat> the work that I've done so far, there the questions that my my stakeholders, my business partners are are asking are questions that no one's found answers to before. So there's there's a this constant <clears throat> level of um, like oh gosh how how am I going to do this? I don't even know where to look for those answers. And then um, something that I, I learned you know even even back in school was you know being building relationships with other people that I'm, I'm working with you know back in, in school it was building relationships with students that we, we would help each other at work it's the same thing um and <clears throat> the it's more overwhelming when i when i when i started a new company and i don't know that the the, the vernacular of the of the when i become more familiar with, with everything it, it just it becomes easier um and so the the most important thing for me is just asking learning learning, learning how to ask the right questions and how to ask them in the right way um, has pretty much got me through most of the the, the unknowns. So um, that's okay. it. Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna have a follow up question. I mean, can you think of some experiences at UCLA that helped prepare you for that for that those challenges? Yeah. Um, I mean, just just classes in general. But a big one um, is was DataFest. No, um, that. because no. We, we, I was it. Sometimes it's hard to ask questions because we, you know, it, it might feel like, you know, am I asking even asking the right question? But getting getting over that and just just getting getting to a point where um, I just ask, you know, has made things a lot easier. Uh, Mallory, let's let's let you choose a prompt. What prompt would you like to answer? Uh, I think I'll answer the last prompt around belonging. So I think this happens throughout. When you're changing into a new air new like time in your life so i think the first time that i felt this kind of uh pressure to belong was in college because you know high school is a lot smaller college is a lot larger uh really intimidating classrooms of over 100 students it's very hard to make friends um but i think it's really important to think that everyone comes from the same space and for example my roommate was someone who i look i met in a stats class uh she just came and sat next to me and was like oh i guess we're gonna spend this quarter together let's be friends and we're still friends to this day and so i think like the advice that i have in regards to that is to really don't be shy put yourselves out there if you're if you are a shy person be open to when someone is not being shy um and definitely do um join some clubs test them out see if they're, that's somewhere that you belong um, very similar to Lance, I think where I really found my group of friends, especially within statistics, is doing data fest. Um, so like my my teammates, I'm still friends with. I play fantasy football with them every year. Um, I like silently zoomed into one of my my teammates' uh, dissertation defense a couple weeks ago. And so it's I think it's really good to just go ahead and like put yourselves out there and join these smaller groups where you can actually find people with common interests. So the relationships you made sounded like they were really an important part of UCLA for you. Yeah, they are definitely. Not good. Yeah, it's going to be a challenge with our first year students starting virtually, but I hope we can get them lots of opportunities to meet each other. Um, and they, it will come. It will come. 
Um, Professor Christou, would you like to choose a prompt to respond? Of course, uh, Rob. I'll go with number one. Be before I start, though, I am in the office today, and please allow me to show you a little bit of the campus today, all right? <laughs> so, okay. So, this is uh, a view from the Math Science Building, eighth floor, facing north. Okay, so if you have a, if you never visited UCLA, that's what you see from the eighth floor math science building, the beautiful UCLA campus. Hopefully, you come and see it soon um, when all this health crisis uh, pandemic is over. Uh, so this is the Karkov Hall here, the student activity center. All there is a library. Uh, patience is a virtue, people say, right? Okay, and also persistence. I remember when I was a student, uh, many times um, I found myself um, uh, to uh, struggle with the material. It wasn't easy. So I, I had to stay up late, sometimes uh, well beyond midnight to understand the material. And, and many times, even though I, I try hard, um, I wasn't able to understand the material with my first or even many attempts, but but um, I I had I had patience. I was I, I never gave up, and also with the help of um, classmates, study groups, with the help of my professors, I was able to um, uh, improve uh, and learn. And also, I kind of uh, transfer those values to my teaching as well. So um, each one of us learn in a different way. Some people need more time. Uh, so I find myself that I, ha I have to be patient with my students, give them time to explore, always here to help, um, while you know, offering many office hours. And so I think that that's my um, short uh, advice. Uh, being, being patient and persistent, um, never give up, challenge yourself as well. If something is, if, if something is challenging, it, it must be good. That's kind of a thing I, I always believe, and we always believe that. And um, yeah, that's it, Rob. All right, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one more quick go around uh, and so you can either choose uh, between those other two prompts or maybe um, uh, as Professor Christou just did offer some advice you'd give to a, a first year student uh, in statistics at UCLA. Um, Mallory, let's start with you this time. Yeah, so I'll go with the, the kind of the values question. I think for me, the way that I think about going through school and also now with the workplace is I think about two things. One being really hard working. Uh, I always like to say like it's okay to not be the smartest person in the room but if you can outwork everyone that's probably the most important and then also to be really humble um because i think you know especially entering uh, ucla you could feel really overwhelmed but you could also feel like oh i know all this stuff already i don't need to study too hard um, but that's never a good attitude to have um, i find that like especially i have actually taken all three of these professors classes and i have to say like when, when professor christo was talking about staying up late. I definitely did that a lot um, over in my statistics career at UCLA. But I think it really paid off because um, a lot of times I think like it's easy to just kind of, oh, you know, working virtually or, you know, like if you're taking online lectures, it's not as interactive. But that actually opens up a lot of opportunity for you to look up things on your own and do some like self-motivated learning, which is really important too. And um, having that kind of open mindset is good even after school, so once you're in the workplace, to always kind of brushing up on your basics, taking another Coursera course or reading like an introductory textbook. I still do that and I feel like I learn something new every time I do it. And there's always new value to be gained from that. Great, yeah. So uh, Lance, what would you like to add? <clears throat> um, I like the, the, the belonging one. Um, you know, where times when I, I didn't feel like I fit in, I. I so I graduated in 2012. I I, <clears throat> I, I started as college, college late, it was essentially 10 years after what you would normally call a, a, a college entry age. Um, so I, I came in and it was I felt I felt awkward because I, I probably everyone thought I was probably a graduate student, but I was an undergrad. 
Um, but I, I, and I guess I, I would mix. So I felt uncomfortable about that. But but once once I started getting into the stats classes and I started meeting people in like the statistics club and I started hanging out and doing study sessions and and like Mallory said, just, you know, making making the friends um, where where the focus of my study was not only um, made long term friends, but it also you know helped me through through getting getting through the classes and, and, and you know, support and uh, we just all we all kind of leaned on each, on each other. So it went from this awkward, like I'm older than everybody else to I'm I'm a part of. Um, and I carried that that sense of, um, you know, <clears throat> that awkwardness in, into into my careers, too, because now I'm now I'm an entry level entry level person out of out of college in my 30s, um, which which was awkward at times. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, hard work makes lots of friends in the professional world in my experience um doing pulling your weight and being being as helpful as possible to to um the people you work with is will will in my experience eliminate all those problems yeah so it sounds like a theme here is learning to be humble and get help from your peers establish relationships and work hard <laughs> Uh, I'm afraid we're out of time, and I'm really sorry we didn't get a chance to get Professor Fondiari up online, um, but I hope they'll get this problem soon. Um, so students, thanks for your attention, and thank you panelists very much. Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to get started. Thank you so much for attending uh, this event today. We're really happy to have you all here and to welcome you as uh, students in the Division of Physical Sciences here at, at UCLA. Um, and I want to remind everyone that this is a fantastic moment for all of us. I want to congratulate you um, because you've been admitted to UCLA. And according to US News and World Report, UCLA is again the number one ranked public institution uh, in the United States. And uh, we've received so many applications from all over the country and really uh, all over the world. So the admission is very competitive here. And um, we're really proud of all of you for having made it uh, this far. So I think you can all give yourselves a round of applause and a, a pat on the back, although we can't uh, see you. Um, we, we appreciate you being here. Um, and that tells you that you're all tremendously accomplished. We're all tremendously proud of you. Um, and we think that you will do great things and you will succeed at UCLA, um, maybe more so than, than you might have imagined um, when you applied. Uh, I'm Jose Rodriguez. I'm uh, an assistant professor of chemistry and biochemistry here in the Division of Physical Sciences at UCLA. And I'm joined by uh, a, one, a wonderful host of faculty and students and alumni who are here to welcome you and tell you a little bit about uh, the UCLA experience. We're also joined by uh, Miguel Garcia Garibay, who uh, will be in one of our breakout rooms. So if you want to talk to the dean, uh, you can join his breakout room um, when the time comes. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask uh, our panel to introduce themselves, and then we're going to briefly tell you uh, a little bit about uh, some of our experiences at UCLA and why we think that UCLA is such a special place, um, and, um, and also uh, hopefully uh, share with you a little bit about our own personal path um, at UCLA. So uh, with that, I welcome uh, each of our panelists to introduce themselves and tell the um, tell you a little bit about uh, their affiliation to UCLA and um, why they think UCLA is so great. We can start maybe with Ron. Hi, I'm Ron Yi. I'm a graduate of UCLA with a degree in math applied science. I graduated in 1984. Um, I met my wife at UCLA. Um, I'm active with the Alumni Association and the Orange County uh, Network. I'm the vice president. And then I'm the one of the co-chair elects for the Parents Council because I've had uh, two children graduate from UCLA and a third one who's in her third year. And I just love doing things for young people and for UCLA. Wonderful. Uh, Andrea, maybe. Hi, I'm Andrea Gez. I'm a professor of physics and astronomy. I've been at UCLA for 26 years. Um, 
You'll find me teaching classes um, like Astro 81, Introduction to Astronomy and Astrophysics, um, or other intro courses. That's, that's what I like to teach. And then from a research perspective, I do a lot of research on black holes. Wonderful. Uh, Mercedes. Hi, my name is Mercedes Allende. I'm a third year math of computation major, and then I'm double minoring in environmental systems and society and cognitive science. I'm from NorCal, like two hours north of the Bay. Um, and then I'm doing research in sustainable transportation through the um, Sustainable LA Grand Challenge program. And then I'm also involved in Clean Consulting Club and Alumni Scholars Club. So. Wow, keeping busy, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. uh, David. Um, hello everybody, I'm uh, David Gonzalez. I'm a postdoctoral researcher uh, in the School of Medicine here at UCLA, but I've been at UCLA for 10 years. I got my uh, bachelor's degree in chemistry in 2012 uh, and liked UCLA so much that I stuck around for a graduate program where I got a master's and PhD in atmospheric and oceanic sciences, and where my research focused a lot on the health impacts of air pollution uh, and what causes inflammation from air pollution. And that's what led me to my postdoc position in the School of Medicine. Um, uh, when I was a graduate student, I was uh, heavily involved in the Organization for Cultural Diversity and Science and really trying to bring the message and the opportunities of higher education to underrepresented people. Uh, and I'm excited to be speaking to you all tonight. Thank you all. And David, that's such a wonderful uh, story. And I'm glad that you have decided to stay at UCLA all along um, because that really brings me to my next question, which is um, how did you find uh, your sense of belonging or your place at UCLA? Um, and what really catalyzed that? Uh, it's clear that you liked UCLA since you've stayed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's true. Um, well, I grew up in the Houston area, and I saw someone in the chat that, that there's someone from, from Houston, and uh, it was, I didn't feel like I belonged there, and even though the place was sort of diverse, and this is something that UCLA has, is, is sort of great diversity, I just didn't feel sort of welcomed or at home, and, and when I got to UCLA and transferred, you know, the first few weeks, just kind of not knowing anybody was tough and, 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 and trying to find the people that you can connect with. I immediately kind of just fell in love with the diversity and the openness of everybody on campus and how it just didn't matter where you were from, what you studied. Uh, everybody was at UCLA and we're all Bruins. And it's amazing how much of that feeling remains to me today because it's one of the reasons why I don't want to leave UCLA. I feel like a dedicated Bruin. And it really helped me kind of find my sort of sense of identity. It gave me a little bit more confidence in, you know, pursuing my goals as an academic. And because of that, the kind of environment of inclusiveness and diversity that UCLA had to offer, I really feel like it fostered uh, my growth more so than if I had stayed back home. And UCLA is such a welcoming community. Um, and I'm glad that we've all found a home here. Uh, Mercedes, how about you? Um, how did you find your place here in um, on campus? Um, so my answer to that question was, uh, well, Pradam, I found my place, I actually made a good group of friends at orientation, which I know is very tough, the online, so that's not a great advice, but um, I guess I found my, like, I realized I belonged here. Um, I had some, a little bit of imposter syndrome in my computer science classes because I chose to take the CS track through the computer science department. Um, and the ratios in those classes aren't great. Um, and what I was telling the other panelists before we went live was um, with the online format, I took CS33 in the spring. Um, and it was really the first time I felt comfortable really like speaking up in discussion um, and actually asking and answering questions in the chat. Um, really made me feel like I actually did belong in those classes, even though I didn't feel like I did from like an outside perspective. But um, yeah, like I love UCLA. I'm really glad I chose to go here. And um, as uh, David was saying, everybody, like 
it really doesn't matter what major you're in. Like I, like some of my best friends are theater majors and didn't meet them in class, of course, but um, I don't know. I have friends across disciplines and I really just love that we're all like unified by as being a Bruin as she, cheesy as it sounds, but really great people go here, so. And you can meet people from all walks of life mm -hmm. um, doing all kinds of exciting things. Uh, Ron, I know um, it's been maybe a couple of years since you graduated, but uh, maybe thinking back to your experience, um, uh, I wonder if you might share with us some of the values that were important to you um, that have made you decide to raise a Bruin family, mm -hmm. a family of Bruins. Well, one of the things that I'm very fortunate to experience when I was at UCLA was to be able to meet John Wooden uh, for the for the students who are just getting into UCLA. You may not know who John Wooden was. He was he was considered the greatest coach in the history of sports, not just basketball but all sports. But he considered himself to be a teacher. And he developed a, a document called the Pyramid of Success. Uh, and most people know about the 15 uh, blocks on the Pyramid of Success. But if you look really carefully along the sides, there are character traits, values that um, hold the pyramid in place. And two of those character traits are integrity and, and Coach Wooden defined it as purity of intentions and ambition and ambition for noble goals. Um, because I got to meet him and speak to him on several occasions, he just made a huge impact on, on my life. And I, I really believe that um, integrity is one of the uh, greatest values we can have. When people know that you'll do the right thing under all circumstances, then you build a lot of trust and then the ambition that I talk about is how we strive to improve ourselves all of the time. It's not a matter of doing it for other people, but doing it for ourselves, how we improve ourselves. So um, I, I try to practice that every day. And I try to, I got into um, mindfulness and um, journaling. So every day I try to write something about how I've done, what I've done to try to improve in those areas. And those are wonderful lessons, Ron. I sure wish we all got the chance to meet John Wooden. That <laughs> sounds like a special, special occasion. Um, maybe uh, now moving on to Andrea, you've uh, accomplished so much in, in life. And of course, we all like to look up to our professors and think that they, uh, couldn't possibly have ever faced the challenges that we face, but I'm sure that uh, maybe at some point you might have doubted that you would succeed at something. Um, and I wonder whether you might uh, like to share with us um, if you've ever felt like you might not succeed at something um, and how that has turned out and how that might inspire some of our students watching today. I've had many moments of doubt and things that I've um, had to overcome. I um, think the clearest example that I can talk about that might relate, that, uh, that might touch upon many of you is the fear of public speaking, which today is quite ironic because I do a lot of public speaking, although when I was an undergraduate, it was the last thing I wanted to do, and I couldn't envision myself having a job which required public speaking. I was nervous to introduce myself, to say my name. <laughs> That's the level of public speaking fear that I, um, I suffered from. And fortunately, I had a professor that forced me to um, sign up to, to be a teaching assistant. And it's, uh, you know, really forced me to do something that I, I was spending a lot of time and energy avoiding. Uh, so it got me outside my box and it helped me understand that I had a tremendous passion for 
for teaching, but teaching is a lot of public speaking. Um, so I, I learned by doing. And today I really think a lot, maybe to combine this and the last topic, about finding one's authentic passions. Um, and that's in part doing the things that you know you love uh, from your past experience, but always pushing yourself outside the box, doing things that you might be um, afraid to do or that you've never experienced because that might expand your world to find um, you know, other, other passions that you just didn't, um, you weren't aware of. Yeah, that really resonates with me. You know, when I was an undergraduate, I also um, was not the greatest uh, public speaker. In fact, English is my second language. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it wasn't when I was growing up, I, um, I spoke fluently in Spanish. And then, in fact, my entire primary education was in Spanish. And so when I transitioned over to speaking English, I was always somewhat uncomfortable, you know, um, not knowing whether or not I was saying things in the most eloquent way. Uh, and so it, it didn't bother me too much initially because I was a pure math uh, major coming in. And so I didn't have to do too much public speaking. Um, eventually, I, I switched over to the physics department and that, you know, it wasn't like I joined theater or anything. So, um, so I still wasn't doing too much. But uh, like you, I also really enjoy teaching and I really enjoy, um, you know, communicating my science with others. Um, and that's really rewarding. So I'm glad that uh, I am where I am now, and I do what I do. Uh, well, that's wonderful. Um, if we, um, since we have a couple of minutes now before the breakout rooms, I was wondering whether anyone else wanted to address um, any of the topics that we've talked about. I know that I've been calling on people, but I, I would like to open up the floor um, so that you all can um, share your experiences with the students. And, and then after that, we'll go into breakout rooms and uh, we'll be able to speak to, to students directly. Um, I actually had an answer for the question about um, like gaining a skill. Um, like a big uh, learning moment for me, my freshman fall quarter was like developing study habits. Um, since it wasn't really a skill I had developed super well in high school. And so, and then I took Math 32A fall quarter, which I'm sure a lot of you are taking. Um, and I didn't do so great on the second midterm. And I really just needed to reevaluate how I was going about the class. And I figured out that like outlining each section in the textbook really helped me understand the material because I'm not an auditory learner. So learning from lecture didn't help me super well. Um, and then that's still what I do. Like I did that in math 115A in the spring and it's just like became, became my system. Um, so yeah, I feel like that's just a really big component of like integrating into the college lifestyle and like would be my biggest advice to any incoming freshmen, so. And thank you for sharing that tip, Mercedes. There, you might also have a unique perspective among um, the rest of us panelists since you lost all day. Did he cut out for everybody or just me? With our, oh, oh okay. sorry, I might have cut out partly. Um, whether you might like to share um, anything about your experience um, relating to online learning. Oh, um, yeah, so the end of when I don't know how familiar everyone is with what went down at the end of last year, but um, so our winter quarter finals were online, which was kind of like a quick transition, which I'm sure as professors wasn't easy either. Um, but and then spring quarter was fully online and it was definitely a switch. Um, I stayed in Westwood the whole time, so I was able to like kind of maintain in my like study like mindset I guess but I know some of my friends that went home like it was hard to like maintain that at home um I guess my biggest piece of advice is like even if the lectures are recorded watch them during the time like it seems easy to like oh just I'll watch like 15 lectures like the weekend before the midterm but there's no way you're going to retain all that information so I feel like just trying to maintain the schedule you would have had it been in person is like a very key 
element. Um, I mean, easier said than done, but also like you don't necessarily have to watch your 8 a.m. at 8 a.m. You can watch it at 10 a.m. and no one's gonna stop you. Yeah. But um, there, there are silver linings. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that, uh, Mercedes, and um, and I want to thank all of our uh, participants. Um, and those in our audience for their attention. 